Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texas Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texas Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had <laughs> no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, right? 50-50 ball, I gotta come down with it. You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. All right, Nick, get your counter ready. It matters when it matters, right? I'm talking about bowl games here. The level of bowl games, what at stake, what is at stake, what the players uh, bring to it. It matters when it matters. And this is because somebody posted yesterday that, you know, bowl games still matter, Nuno. And I never said they don't matter, but they don't matter the way they used to. That's the bottom line. Um, playoffs matter. But if players are not playing in games for whatever reason, reason opting out um, or NFL or the transfer portal, it doesn't matter to them. It matters to those who go play, and that's the part I'm excited about. I'm excited about seeing Jalen Henderson and Le'Veon Moss and Bryce Foster, all those dudes work. Now, this is not a sexy bowl game tonight, but it is a game tonight, and now I've got my, uh, I got my juices back because it is a game day, so we're, we're going to talk about it here. Um, a win closes out 23, not in style, but it closes it out in, on a better note because upward trajectory. We're going to get into that here uh, this morning on Tex Ags Radio. Presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. I'm David Nuno, and he is our Heisman Trophy voter, Olin Buchanan, my buddy. What's up, man? Um, let's see. Trying to, I was trying to sleep uh, longer today. Yeah. Because I'm going to have a very late night, right? And of course, I woke up at 4 a.m. <laughs> I wanted to try to sleep all the way till seven, right? Right. Of course, I woke up at four. Understanding there's an eight o'clock game. It's going to be, let's say, three and a half you hours. You can't just keep closing your eyes? I, I do. Okay. I just don't go back to sleep. How long do you try? Well, let's see, from four to seven, that would be three Oh, so hours. you did try the whole time. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, did you I kind probably, of snooze probably a little about bit? Six th- maybe, maybe. Okay. I, I might have nodded here and there, but from si- uh, at 6.30, I said, I might as well get up. So, you know, eight, let, let's say what, what? What do we say? Hour and a half, I mean, three and a half hour game if we're lucky? Oh, if we're lucky with commercials, a bowl game? So, so we should probably say four hours. Midnight at the earliest that the game ends. But your work begins then, buddy. Right. So I better be riding a lot during the game. Right. Right. So, uh, but hey, you know what? I'm not going to complain. This is a job we signed up for. Some, I once covered a game. A Texas A&M game out in Lubbock that started on Saturday and ended on Sunday. Oh no! The game didn't kick off till like nine thirty, and you know it was Mike Leach throwing the ball around. Oh, that's a five hour game. Oh right yeah, there. it was crazy. So the, it was like a two. I said instead of today's game, you said two days game. Two days game. <laughs> Look, I mean it. Like, I'm sorry if it hurts your feelings. Bowl games don't matter the way they used to. Oh, they don't. That's just a fact. Yeah, it's first of all, it started with the. What's the word? Prolifin? I'm trying to use a big word. Prolifery? When, when there's too many. Okay. Uh, the, when, when they just started coming out of the woodwork. You know, you had bowl games named after. They used to matter because the games week. mattered, because, right? Because, first of all, there were so few of them at one time that getting in one was a big deal. And then there was just so many of them. And then it got to be like, well, now I can go pro. So I think it was one of the uh, – who are the brothers? One of them is a first-round pick, defensive ends. One went to the Chargers. One went to the uh, – Oh, uh, Bosa's? Not, Bosa's. Yeah. One of the Bosa's, I think, was the first one, the one at Ohio State. Said, I'm not going to play. Joey Bosa, right? Yeah, I think so. And so other people say, yeah, why should I play and risk getting hurt? And the kid from Notre Dame really got hurt in a bowl game. 
And so more and more people started setting out, and now you add the the transfer portal, and, and all of a sudden you're like, you don't recognize the rock, the lineups. If it's on the schedule, I want to play in it, right? Like, yeah. For instance, I thought you played football because it's fun. Yeah, football's great, and but it's like what we were talking about before the show. You feel like coming to work no matter what. Right. When you're sick, you're like, I got to find a way to work, uh, even though I think you should take your well, time off. Right. But that's how you're wired. I hope my kids are wired that way because that's what we train them at home. Like that train, that's like they're <laughs> an animal. But that's that's the the values that I've instilled in them. Right. Right. Like if it's on your schedule, we don't miss a practice. We don't miss a game. Right. Like there's got to be a re- school. Okay, I understand. But like, just because you're like, I, I want to go to my friend's house. No, no, no. We got to go. I want to go in the NFL. Well, then put some great film on. But it's a different era. Mm-hmm. We're old men. We're yelling at the clouds. And people are going to do what they want to do. So, so uh, and now uh, imagine how, how uninteresting the bowl games are going to be next year when there's 12 teams in yeah. the playoffs. But... Well, we both said yesterday, and I think somebody misconstrued what, we were, what I was saying, at least. The game's going to matter to me when it starts. It matters as, to me right now. As soon as, the, yeah, as soon as they actually start playing, you know, I, I'll always be emotionally invested in hoping the Aggies win, you know? Um, but I have to be honest with myself. Does, the, does it mean as much to me uh, as it used to? Bowl up? games used to be must-watch if it was on TV for me. And each year... There's only a few that are must watch. Right. Right. And then, and then with the playoff, even the, I don't know if even the New Year's six games are must watch anymore because of the playoff. And there'll be even less. Yeah. You know, I, I guess they'll all be incorporated into the playoff next year. So that, that'll be different. But um, I just, am I going to, if I wasn't working, would I watch the Aggies? Absolutely. Yeah. Would I root for them? Absolutely. I guess here's the difference. For me, and maybe for some of the people listening, um, if the Aggies were in a bowl game ten years ago and they lost, it might keep me up at night. I might be frustrated, and if they lose now, I'm like, okay, well, but is, let's hope they have a great year next year. Is that now because of where the program is? No, today? it's because of what the bowl games are. Because, like I said, that's not the that's not going to be. The, I don't even think it's going to be the majority of the starting lineup that we've seen all year. It's not. There's going no. to be guys playing that have barely played. And, yeah, I, you know, I hope a guy like DJ Hicks goes out there and gives me a glimpse of what he's going to bring to the table next year. But this year, he's had a small role. Right. So uh, – Proliferation, SB says. Thank you. That's the word. Thank you. I only make a, a word uh, – a living using words. Yeah, I've got a – I've got to get a better. Um, um, what's that word? It means you know. You, it means you know a lot of words. Uh, I got a better um, uh, vocabulary. <laughs> Vocab <laughs> dictionary of my mind. <laughs> anyway, Wikipedia. So I guess to me that's the difference. Yeah. You know you don't. It, it, but if this bowl were, games now don't don't hurt as much if you, and, and I'm not celebrating as but much. I think if they it win. also depends on where your program is. For instance, well, if it's in the playoff, <laughs> for a team that doesn't get to New Year's Six bowls. It matters when they get to a New Year's Six Bowl. It may not matter to Georgia that one year, what was it, a couple years back when they lost? Was it the Texas? Texas? Yeah, or Florida when they played yeah. Oklahoma and everybody had stayed out. Right. So it may not matter for the team that's you, that expected the playoffs or expected that. But if it's new to you, I think it matters. I think the bowl games, by and large, matter to the teams. I think it matters more. It depends on the matchup. And I'll tell you what I mean. First of all, I think it means a lot to the group of six teams. Or group mm-hmm. of five conferences, right? You know, those, those guys, group of five. Sure. Uh, and I think it may, I really believe this. I think if you're a run-of-the-mill Big Ten, ACC, Big 12 team, and you get a chance to play an SEC team, and SEC is always trumpeted as the yeah. best, it means more to you because I can find some validation in myself in beating an SEC team. So I think it might matter in that case – more to the SEC team. I'm just saying, by and large, that the bowl games don't matter to the players. Yep. The players sit out as those that can. Uh, they'll make any injury will be an excuse. Um, of course, for some guys, that's the case during the season, but that's another story. Um, and they can be somebody else's problem. Um, but um, 
I, I think when, like, like you mentioned Florida and, uh, and Georgia a couple of years ago, when you have a big-time bowl game like the Sugar Bowl or the Cotton Bowl and you're going to play that game and four or five of your absolute best players say, yeah, I don't think I'm so. I'm good. How do you, you, so the outcome does not give you a, an idea – a representation well, of what would have of the strength of the of the actual strength of the teams throughout the season. I have a lot of empathy for Florida State. I don't like the way they're handling this. Players and the program itself, uh, the bowl game does not matter to them going to this Orange Bowl because they expected to be in the playoffs. They thought they should be in the playoffs. I'm going to rewind it a little bit. A and M was in the mm-hmm. exact same scenario. Mm-hmm. They were robbed of that playoff appearance, mm-hmm. and I think. For both North Carolina and A and M, that Orange Bowl mattered. It was a big deal. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, maybe so. And maybe at that point, uh, the Aggies were um, at a point where getting into a, a a New Year's Six bowl game was really big because they had not been in one since uh, of that ilk since the Cotton Bowl in 2012. Right. So it didn't happen very often. But also understand. That was the uh, what was that the tenth game all year, yeah. And again, and it, and I think North Carolina had some dudes that didn't play. In they that did, one. yeah. They did a couple of uh, I think running back receivers, and of course they still had Sam Howell out there. <laughs> pretty good, <laughs> yeah. pretty good college quarterback. He was a good quarterback, pretty good pro quarterback, with no talent around him. Yeah. Uh, look, I I am excited to see Jalen Henderson. I mean, there's certain players that I I, I want to see. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm excited to see Micah Tees. I'm excited to see Moose. I am. Right? Yeah. Like, but I saw this note. Let me see if I... I wanted to see more Moose this year. I mean, I'll, I'll maybe give it to you later. I can't find it right now. But there's a, a note on Moose that I found very intriguing and, and interesting. But regardless, there's a lot of, like, story... I'm interested in this offensive line. It's not going to be that different, obviously. Right? Like, I mean, you, ha- you don't have your offensive line coach, your new one, taken over just yet. But I'm interested to see, can, can they block a little bit and, and, and get Le'Veon going or Ruben going or Amari going? Is Jalen going to throw deep? Like, what, what is the offense going to look like? Because it's not the Bobby Petrino offense. No. It's a conglomeration of yeah. that and what they've done and maybe some new wrinkles. But see, to me, that all adds into, yeah, that's interesting and all, but it still adds to the, to the argument, does the bowl game even matter? I mean, you, I don't even have the same offense of coaches. But I bet you, I don't know if I have the same offense that I've seen all year. God, I bet you, you've God, gone, I hope not. You've gone outside and Quinn's playing basketball with one of his buddies, and you get into that game. His competition is beautiful. Like we love. How have you played tic tac toe and like gotten really invested in a tic tac toe game? Because I have. Uh, we. I was once. The Connect Four champion of super champion of the it matters. Household. Competition matters. And you know what, my son did. He went on on uh, what is it YouTube and found that the key to always winning and you know connect four. I never beat him again. It's actually I kind of admire that you know yeah. having the chutz spot to go out there. There are some tricks in tic tac toe that you can do so you never lose. Right? There's like, but I don't want people googling that because I just put the on. X in a corner or the O, whatever you start with. Just put it in a corner and you're gonna win. Not necessarily. Not There's necessarily. more to that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think many seven-year-olds have tried that okay, against me and failed. Okay, tic-tac-toe tournament between me and I, Nuno. That's fine. Oh, gosh, uh, I am looking to forward to uh, playing basketball against Luke Evangelist, who thinks he's going to beat me. Luke doesn't strike me as the most athletic guy. Nick is athletic. Okay? Okay. Wasn't the best basketball player, but athletic and strong. I think... Nick would beat Luke, but I've never seen Luke play. He might have a shot, so that's very disrespectful to say out loud. Uh-huh. That's just my opinion. Is they probably both? It, it might be zero zero at the end of it, but I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of like watching a, a, a bowl game with guys who haven't played. All you year. haven't you seen. Just them. don't know what to you expect. don't know. <laughs> you might have an idea, but, but you, you don't might know. Be wrong. Yeah, but doesn't Vegas have A and M winning? Probably. I think I saw some. But again, I'll say this. I say this all the time. If you are inclined to actually put American currency on this game, you need to call that 800 number and get some help. Like you did a year ago. If you, oh, sorry. Okay. If you are to the point where you will 
place your hard-earned money, I assume it's hard-earned, on a game that you don't even know who's playing and all those things, then, then it's, time to, it's time to get some help. All right, uh, if you want to be part of the conversation this morning, you can do it multiple ways. You can call us. We'll take the calls, uh, 979-693-1150, or you can text us. Uh, we'll pick that up, 979-693-1150. If you do call us, we'll pick it up on the Brian Foley Law Hotline. Um, also, I want to read this text from RB. I don't know how to say his name. Morning, Ags. Can someone there at Texax please get Nuno a wireless headphone? I think that's in the works of the new studio once it's ready. I believe it is. Hmm. Uh, you don't he, care. I really don't. And people really get annoyed by the headphone popping out because the technology here, we're, we're advancing. I, I, yeah. Uh, those are something that... It doesn't bug you. No. 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 Let's go behind the glass and continue talking with our friend Nick Savage. Nick, good morning, buddy. I had your back in basketball. Yeah, I appreciate it. Actually, just going back to what you just said, uh, the Cowboys are a three-point favorite over the Aggies oh, tonight. Oh, so it's changed. Yeah, it's okay. changed. So they're, they're favored now. But... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back a little bit to what y'all were saying earlier in terms of bowl, bowl games. You know, I'm with you on paper. A lot of these bowl games that we see every day are not very attractive, but every day I can find myself watching Minnesota and Bowling Green or Kansas UNLV. And, you know, even going back to the crappier bowl games, I mean, Old Dominion and who was it? How many uh, of those games did you watch the whole game? I watched all three games yesterday. The whole game? Yes. Do you, do you do anything else? Well, yesterday I didn't, no. Okay. But yeah. How many you, steps did you get in yesterday? You, you need Not to get many. married. Yeah, well, that's the thing. <laughs> Honey, I need you to do this. My fiance is not in town. She's with her family, oh. so I had a lot oh. of free time on my hands. So that explains it. But anyways, I just think, yes, you're right. The bowl games are meaningless. But at the end of the day, like it's college football, and I feel like there's, there's a, you know, select, bit of the population that will watch it no matter what. I hate using the word meaningless because they do m matter to those kids playing. It doesn't have the same meaning to the casual fan and to the players who obviously opted out. Well, it'll, you know, right or wrong, it'll be on the, uh, it'll be on your record. Mm -hmm. So A&M's looking to go eight and five. I only like it when we again. win. That's the only time I like it on yeah. my record. Or they're seven and six, which is I think the record they had in someone's last year. Hmm. And that was also Texas Bowl. Am I wrong about that? No, no, that was that, one, that, was, that was Belt Bowl. Yeah, that was Belt Bowl up, and they lost. They lost to Wake Forest despite an amazing performance from Christian Kirk, one of those guys going to the draft that actually played. Oh, what a concept! Played great. Sandman says Luke should only challenge Nuno to a game of horse. Why? That's not what the bet was about. I'm not a good shooter, and I, do, I dominate on defense. That's, that's why we wanted to play Is the there game. a version of horse for equestrian? Yes, yeah, called hoops. Like, okay, I got to jump, you know, this, this obstacle this high. Okay, now you This many minute bowls, and you get, yes. Okay. I think only I like just four think equestrian should play horse. Hey, let's have a break, and... Uh, how would you celebrate a bull day eating wise? Like if you were going to like, it's a bull. Would you get a bowl of rib tips? Oh, if it was Tuesday or Saturday. Yeah. It's more like a styrofoam cup, but it's close enough. To I a use bowl. bowl because. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and th that would be, you know, that would be apropos because if you win, what a great celebration of flavor in your mouth. Mm. Your taste buds are like doing a victory lap mm. and a dance. Mm. Keep talking if, to me. But if you lose, you know, talk about comfort and consolation. Yes, we lost, but at least I get to revel in this gastronomical. Uh, That's a great word. Yeah, I like that. Th Good this uh, gastronomical consolation, you know. So uh, you couldn't go wrong. Now, you know, if it was on another day, say a Wednesday, I might. If I win, celebrate with a baked potato. Which is know, today, by the way. Especially if I was watching the Idaho Potato Bowl mm, mm, mm. with some chopped beef on it. I like the way you, you know, think, buddy. If yeah. it was the next day, I might go for a big pork chop. You know, I usually ask you certain is questions. There a catfish bowl? There ought to be. There, well, well, you can tell them to put it in a bowl. There ought to be a catfish bowl. So I'm going to, you know, usually I give you one line and you finish it for me. Yeah. I'm going to give you a different line. Okay. 1701. 1701. 
Texas Avenue. South Texas Avenue. In Bry. In Bryan, Texas. Without a doubt, the what? The best barbecue in Texas, i.e. the absolute world. You know that's their trademark. Well, you know it's true. Yeah, I do. It's Fargo's. Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. My apologies to Jerry. I didn't see that he called uh, at 979-693-1115 until the break. Jerry, if you want to call back, we'll get you on here momentarily. My apologies for not seeing it. It's Texas Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. OB, before we get into our matchups, um, quickly, I did something I did not expect to do. What was that? I actually looked at it, uh, puppies foster or like on a line adoption. I didn't think I was going to do it anytime. I'm, I don't think I'm going to do it, but it was one of those things like, I'm just going to, you know, once you Google, mm. it leads down a path. So those who don't know, we lost our dog last two weeks ago and uh, we've, we've been sad. And I was like, I'm not going to do it for five years, you know, like that in my mind. And then there was a moment I was like, I just want to see what's out there. Yeah. I did that. Um, that would be very commendable. Yeah. Billy's the one who almost talked me into it. He was like, dude, like, like, why are you, you know, like, it's okay to be in mourning, but like. Yeah, but then you fall in love with that dog, and you're supposed to give him up eventually. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Well, no, 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 like to adopt. Oh, to adopt. To oh, adopt. Okay. Yeah, there yeah, was yeah, a moment yeah. I was like, yeah, I don't know if I'll go there. But I thought you were talking about uh, fostering or something. No, well, from a foster. Oh, okay, gotcha, uh, gotcha. It was that moment of maybe, maybe I should, um, but especially because our pup at home is like depressed, yeah. unfortunately. So, hey, um, let's do this. Let's do our matchups brought to you by Bach Realty. Bach Realty brokered by real full service residential real estate team run by former Texas radio host Gabe Bach and his wife Megan. Megan, Gabe, and their team ready to help you from luxury and new construction to farm and ranch, first time home buyers, investment properties, and much, much more. Let Bach Realty Group be the Aggies you trust for all of your real estate needs. All right, OB, give me some matchups you want to talk about. Well, let's about. start up at this. You want to talk about this one? Uh, AM quarterback Jalen Henderson against the Oklahoma State pass defense. You know, let's look at this. I think we can all agree that Jalen Henderson has been in a, a very pleasant surprise. You know, in, in, uh, Three games, he's thrown for around 800 yards. He's got about six touchdowns. You know, he's, he's been better than any of us really expected. Right. And he's going to be going against an Oklahoma State pass defense that's ranked 125th in the nation. You know, they've been lit up sometimes. Now, they're pretty good at interceptions. I think they got about 12 or 13, but um, but not very good in, in preventing your uh, their opponents from running up and down the field and catching a lot of passes on them. Can Jalen Henderson – capitalize on that and can he do it without some of the best receivers you know starting tight ends not i the sometimes starting tight end is no longer available you know uh johnson left you don't have evan stewart you know you don't have my uh uh anaya smith looks like you don't have noah thomas so but anaya is the one that and noah too by the way but anaya really offensively he was carrying this team but um but, you know, Jade Walker's looked pretty good, and uh, Moose Muhammad is this guy that I always thought was criminally underused. So um, you've got a third-string quarterback and basically – who started the year as a third-string quarterback and basically some backup receivers going against one of the uh, more more challenged pass defenses in the country. How's that going to work out? Right. So I think that's an interesting one to look at. I do, too. I do How about too. the A&M running backs against the Oklahoma State run defense? You How know? are they stopping the run? Um. Mm. Not bad, but not great. Um, they've allowed an average of 174 rushing yards in the country. Maybe I should say not, just not great and leave it at that. They uh, rank 106 in the nation. They have gave up 198 yards or more, or, or, or more rushing yards in three of their four losses. So when you run well against them, they have a, a lot of trouble. a and I, I don't know. Have, did I miss it? Is Amari Daniels out? No, I, I mean, okay. I know Billy reported that all three have been in and out of right. practice, so, but I don't know what that means. But, you know, Le'Veon Moss, Amari Daniels, Reuben Owens, they've all had shining moments. Mm-hmm. Nobody's been that consistently. Bell cow. Bell cow. So, but if, um, if you were to say one, the most consistent went out there has been Le'Veon. Yeah, I agree with that when he's out there. So, um, you know, they've all combined for about 1,357 rushing yards, 13 touchdowns. That's not bad if it's one guy. Right. Um, so that position's been somewhat productive. So, again, are they going to be that team, those three guys behind that offensive line with some new faces and that can run enough on Oklahoma State to uh, to give them trouble? I don't know. Yeah, I agree with that, all that. How about this one, since we're talking about running? How about Oklahoma State running back Ollie Gordon? Mm, he's good. Against, uh, and I'm going to break it down and put it against A&M linebacker Torian York. Um, and the reason how come I'm putting it so much on Tory and York is there's so many guys that we don't know have been so good against the run for AM that's not playing. I, McKinley Jackson's going to be out. Uh, Fidel Diggs, um, uh, Walter Nolan, Edron Cooper. And we don't know. If we Shamar don't know Turner's, about Shamar Turner. Right. We don't know how good DJ Hicks is going to be because we see him in a small. All those things. Yeah. But we know Tory and York consistent. is a consistent bulldog. Right. So we're talking about the guy, Oklahoma State's Ollie Gordon, who leads the nation in rushing yardage. Got 20 touchdowns rushing as well. Uh, When he is held under 100 yards, Oklahoma State's lost three or four games. Mm -hmm. Hold him under 100 yards, you better, you know, 20, you know, 75% chance you win. Right. So um, the, the driving force, I would say, and and that run defense in this game will be Tory and Yorkie more so than ever. I I I agree. I agree. I I am so intrigued by seeing these guys that we know have it or we expect to have it show us that they have it. And DJ Hicks is one of those names. Yeah. Like 
I know it's going to click. Hopefully it's uh, tonight, mm -hmm. but we know it's coming. Right. Well, I believe that too. Uh, but it, and it can't be just him though. There's other guys that you haven't seen a whole lot of. Yeah. We'll see more of. Uh, and let's take this uh, kind of the same theme on to the A and M pass rush against the Oklahoma State offensive line during the regular season. The Aggies fierce one of the fiercest pass rush in the country. Yep. Forty two sacks, eighth highest uh, total in the country, and I think five of the teams ahead of them have played an extra game, more games than A and M. So. Uh, that just underscores how dominant the A&M pass rush has been. But Edron Cooper led that pass rush. He's he not playing. Shamar Turner is next. We don't know if he's playing. We probably won't know until right before the game tonight, right? Yep. Other guys have been in there, like Walter Nolan, have had an impact on the pass rush. Now, Oklahoma State, now they've allowed only 13 sacks all year. Right. I mean, that's a good total. Now, part of that's because they've been – running the ball a lot, but another, a bigger part of that is because uh, they primarily face opponents that don't have very good pass rushes. In fact, I looked it up, and uh, Texas is the only Oklahoma State opponent this season that ranked among the nation's top 50 in sacks. Texas number 33. All right, let's hit a break there. When we come back here on Texas Radio, we're actually going to talk to somebody who's going to be on the call tonight. <laughs> Roy Philpott's going to be joining us from ESPN. He'll be on the uh, Brian Foley Law Hotline, so we'll talk to him about his thoughts heading into this one. Right now, though, say hi to my buddy Brian Dickerson. Uh, he owns and he, he operates Ascend Concrete Lifting and Support. Uh, you don't have to replace it, guys. You don't have to replace your, your driveway. You can just lift it. That's right. Ascend locally, Aggie owned and operated. They provide an easy, clean service at half the price of replacement. If you thought about replacing your driveway or some concrete in the backyard, whatever, you don't have to. That's very, very expensive. You can lift it and get it all even looking almost seamless, like almost brand new out there. They'll educate you on the lifting process, the materials that they'll use. They tell you why concrete tends to settle in a certain way. And by the way, they are going to service the entire state of Texas. They're obviously here locally in the Brazos Valley, but they're nationwide as well. They'll go where you need them. 979-933-8527. They can raise and stabilize any form of concrete and slab. And once the project is finished, the appearance is close to seamless to the eyes out there. They do residential. They do commercial. They do industrial and municipal bridges and curbs and sidewalks. You name it. Airport runways. Fraction of the cost of replacement. So you need to reach out to them and get that free estimate. Follow us, send lift on Facebook or Instagram, or call them 979 933 8527 to make an appointment. It is a send lift.
Welcome back into Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Do want to read this text that came in? There is a Houston A and M Club tailgate going on at the game tonight in the green lot, starting at 4:30 uh, p.m. Hosted by the 12th Man uh, AFS and the Houston A and M Club, I should say. So, thank you very much for that text in there. Uh, it is Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Ob, myself. And uh, let's talk a little bit more about the game. Go inside of it, OB. Let's uh, go to the Brian Foley Law Hotline. We're joined by Roy Philpot, who is going to be on the call tonight there at NRG Stadium. Roy, good morning. How are you? I'm doing well, gentlemen. Appreciate the invitation. Looking forward to the game tonight. I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be quite the atmosphere here in Houston. It should be quite nice. Yeah, yeah it'll be fun. Roy, how, how difficult is it to prepare for games, <laughs> bowl games today, as opposed to maybe five years ago, a couple years back with – Players now entering the portal. Play obviously more players going into the NFL draft earlier than they used to. All those things and not really knowing, like A and M, perfect example of not really knowing who's going to play for them. Yeah, it's not easy. I mean, it's hard to know what to expect tonight. You know, I, I take a lot of pride when we have our production meetings at ESPN and, and talking to our crew and kind of I don't want to say forecasting what's going to happen, but having a sense of what could happen. Tonight is not one of those mm-hmm. nights. I mean, when you look at Texas A and M on defense and probably down to just two normal starters, it, it's hard to predict what that looks like. When you look at their offense and you're probably down to three or four legitimate wideouts, it's hard to predict, you know, what's going to happen. So it, it is totally different than what it used to be. I mean, even just before COVID in 2019, you know, we we had a, the same game in this same bowl game uh, four years ago between the Cowboys and the Aggies. And it, 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 it was much easier then. Now you, you don't know who's ready to go. You don't know whose mind is truly in it. Like the guys are going to play tonight. Are they truly all there? Like, are, are they going to going to give up, you know, if it's the second quarter in a 10 point game and, and they're thinking ahead towards where they want to go next year. It's hard to predict. I, I think it makes it more compelling in a certain respect, but yeah, it's, it's a night and day difference. Talking to the staff this week, they would tell you the same thing and how they're getting ready for this game. Yeah, I wanted to ask, how, how much help do the coaches give you uh, in terms <laughs> of what to look for or, or uh, I guess, background on some of the guys? Or I, I wonder, I mean, especially in A&M's case, I mean, there's guys here, coaches here that aren't going to be around. I wonder uh, how much they even know. I would tell this to Aggie fans, like this staff has done a remarkable job behind the scenes of staying in the present. And I don't think that that's easy to do. If you're Elijah Robinson and you're off to Syracuse and you've been recruiting some for the Orange during your downtime, whenever time that's been over the course of the last few weeks, you're being tugged in all different directions. But, you know, he reiterated to us guys this week that that he wanted to be there for this team. He recruited a lot of these players and I think I I believed him. I think his mind has been there and he has done everything in his power. He has used every second of every day when he's been there in College Station to get ready for this game and to get his guys ready for the game. I think James Coley, the same thing. DJ Durkin, the same thing. I think Coach E has done a remarkable job of making sure that he's not micromanaging, letting his coordinators kind of do their business to, to prepare for Oklahoma State. Uh, but it hasn't been easy. And I mean, to a man, they they all said this week, you know, this has been a, a surreal moment in our coaching careers because, you know, like you said, you know, they're they're off to, to other places after this game. But I think they have done their absolute very best to keep these players, you know, a, in the focus front and central and, and to have them ready. And I, I think that they will be tonight. You know, I don't know pound for pound how the matchups will shake out when you got some young guys stepping in within that front three, front four. Um, and, and some faces that haven't played a lot this year. There's talent there, but they just don't have a lot of experience. You know, so that that's the wild card. That's the X factor. But I think the staff has done a really good job in just getting what they have ready to go. Roy, a guy who doesn't have that much experience is Jalen Henderson, yet he is somebody I'm not worried about tonight. Just your thoughts on his transition as the third quarterback A&M has used this year and the success he's had. I, I think he's overachieved. And the one thing I'll say about Jalen Henderson, start number four tonight. We've seen him at the end of the year. He's done a good job. He's got a live arm. And I think when he was brought to College Station, that that was the thought process for a Bobby Petrino as he evaluated and, and kind of looked at quarterbacks that were out there. You bring him in from Fresno State or they've had him from Fresno State. And he wanted to make sure that, you know, that arm strength was there. He checks that box. It comes out at different arm angles. And it'll be different, as you guys know, but he can work the ball down the field. And I, I think he is a known commodity, honestly. Um, I think he does a good job protecting the football. 
they're going to have to push it a little bit. I think if you're going to beat Oklahoma State, you're, you're looking at their secondary and wondering, okay, where can we attack? And um, I think if I'm James Coley, that's what I'm thinking about coming into this game. They've shown the ability at times this year where maybe they haven't been as sturdy back there. So that comes down to Jalen Henderson. Let's look at the accuracy. Let's see if his receivers, some of these new faces and familiar names, but you know, can they consistently get open against Oklahoma State's corners and safeties? I think that that's a matchup to watch. But I, I like him. Um, you know, our crew likes him. I work with Roddy Jones. He played running back at Georgia Tech and is a very good evaluator of talent. I think he likes his arm talent and kind of what he brings to the table. And he's got a couple of starts underneath his belt. So, you know, this is his opportunity to come out and shine and and, and let's see what he can do. There's going to be a lot of people watching. I think this is going to be a highly rated bowl game. Like I mentioned with the atmosphere, I think it's going to be legit. So, uh, yeah, let's let's see what Jalen can do tonight. I, I think there's a lot of confidence in what he brings to the table. Hey, Roy, the um... – had things been different, the most, I guess, compelling matchup in this whole game would have been uh, Ollie Gordon against that A&M run defense. Of course, you know, yeah. you just mentioned how, how many guys from A&M's run defense or defense as a whole aren't going to be there. So what becomes some of the more compelling storylines that you can focus on at least going into the game? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, beyond it's interesting. A&M's, looking- <laughs> beyond a and M skeleton crew, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, initially when we were assigned this game and we had our our production meeting, the thought was, you know, Ollie Gordon the second against the run D. And, and then you quickly quickly realize, you know, Walter Nolan, Diggs, Jackson, Overton, handful of other guys are, are not going to be playing. But there's talent there. And so let's see what, you know, a Ryland Kennedy can do and Albert Regis and some of these other guys, you know, it, it, assuming that the, those guys are playing. I still think that that's worth watching. I want to see Torian York and kind of what he brings to the table. You know, I, I will say, I don't know that I've heard a staff just glow about a freshman linebacker like what I've heard for York this week. And, you know, the film doesn't lie. He, he doesn't look like a first-year player. So you know that that's a guy you can build around. I think how does he handle a guy like, you know, Ollie Gordon the second? And the way he likes to stiff arm in a weird way, I think that's something to watch tonight with the way that Gordon, when he gets to that second and third level, he's going to give you, he's going to try to smash you. And and for a guy like York, you know, is he going to be able to deal with that? I, I think the answer is yes, but that's how Gordon breaks off these huge runs and has these huge production games in the second half as he just starts wearing defenses down. So I, to me, that is something I think, you know, that, that our crew wants to look at and see. You know, how does that balance itself out? But, yeah, I mean, there, there's no secret. Oklahoma State wants to run it. Ali Gordon the second was the best running back in the country this year. Uh, the Doak Walker Award winner, obviously. Um, and, and so A&M is going to be charged with, with just trying to slow him down. I mean, it's game tackling, finding a way to rip through that stiff arm and just getting him to the ground when he busts through that first level. Uh, and, and so, yeah, that's that, to me, that that's something I want to see. And, and how does York versus Gordon – how does that thing size up by the time we get to the fourth quarter? You mentioned what it means to this coaching staff, outgoing coaching staff, I should say. But what what is your sense of what it means to the players that are going to be in this game beyond Jalen Henderson and the Moose Mohammeds and the Torian Yorks? Yeah, I mean, I, I look, I you know, I think Mike Elko is going to be watching tonight. He's going to join us in the in the booth in the second quarter uh, for the Texas A and M fans that, that want to hear from their their new head coach. I'm curious to get his take on on just the personnel and the hand that he's been dealt. Um, you know, just listening to to some of the guys this week and our conversations with them as a crew, they want to win. Like, I mean, there is a sense, it, it's weird, you know, sometimes when you get teams that are faced with adversity, everybody kind of comes together and everybody's kind of got each other's back. I do feel like that applies this week. Now, at the first sign of adversity, if let's say you get down by seven or 10 points in the first half, does everybody kind of maintain that? I, I think that is something to watch. And, and look, that Potentially, that could be for both sides, even though Oklahoma State's bringing back most of their guys, it sounds like, from the regular season. How does A&M handle maybe that first punch and do guys stay together? It seems like that they're together. You hear them talk about brotherhood. Uh, that's, a, that's a common theme this week in practice and the rodeo bowl and all these other things that they've done. So I like that. So I, I do think it's meaningful for you know the roster, for the guys that are coming back, for the guys that want to be back next year, uh, for a guy like Torian York, who you know, is an incredible leader and is playing anything like a first year guy, you know, there in Temple, Texas, um, you know, it's, it's quite meaningful. So 
I, I think they're there. I want to see what happens if they have to deal with a little adversity. Does that whole mantra kind of stick uh, throughout the course of these four quarters tonight? Roy, if it was difficult for you to prepare for, for this game, um, now let's fast forward a year from now when there's 12 teams in the playoff. How <laughs> difficult do you think it's going to be for games of this ilk uh, moving forward? That's one thing we're not talking enough about <laughs> because I think we're all excited that 12 teams are going to get in. You know, I said on Sirius XM radio this morning, I, I feel like for a team like Texas A&M, for a team like Oklahoma State, you know, Penn State, there's a handful of teams that you just feel like have been knocking on the door um, that have the talent to make the playoff. But with only four teams getting in, you know, it's it's been difficult. That starts to change next year. But for the teams that don't make the playoff, you look at the bowl schedule and you think about, OK, what do some of these games feel like? I, I, you know, I don't think it's great. I, I think it changes. It, it starts to be more like the NIT. Hopefully Buzz isn't listening right now. Um, <laughs> then, then, you know, what it has been in the past. So we're talking college basketball. If you don't make the dance, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of out of luck. So it, I, I, I don't know. I want to get there. I want to experience it. But the coaches I've talked to, uh, to a man, you know, it's like next year, the 12 team playoff, if you're not in these bowl games, they're good bowl games good payouts and, and are well attended uh it, it's not going to have the same feeling even as what we're going to get tonight so I, I i don't know what that means long term but it's gentlemen i think it's going to feel vastly different in the future roy i really enjoyed it thanks so much for making time let's do it again in the future anytime jim happy to do it thank you man take care roy philpott there on the brian foley law hotline we'll hit a break We'll get some final thoughts here on the go hour with ob but right now we're talking about the association of former students the year's coming to a close, obviously, and uh, hopefully you guys are going to have a, a great party or just celebrate with your family. But the Association of Former Students wants to thank you uh, to the Aggie Network for their generous support throughout the years. You guys have done such a wonderful job. As a reminder, they are a 501c3 nonprofit organization supporting Texas A&M and Texas Aggies all over the place. The association would not be able to help musters across the world, host Aggie ring days throughout the year, support A&M clubs, or provide scholarships and assistance students uh, without your support. In this season of giving, would you help the Aggie Network spread some holiday cheer by considering making a gift to the Association of Former Students? Renew your Century Club membership if you haven't done so already. Become a first-time member or give a membership to another Aggie. The Association works year-round to be there for Aggies, and they cannot do it alone. To make a gift, visit tx.ag slash cheer23.
Welcome back into to Tex-Ax Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. It is uh, the Go Hour, presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations, and it's a bowl game. Texas Bowl here a little bit later. Billy will be with us in studio. I never actually gave everybody the uh, the rundown for the show. John Harris, Tom Schuberth, Billy Lucci, and Ryan Broniger the rest of the way. So we'll be that's packed a, that's, a, that's a Texas Rangers kind of it lineup is. right there. Billy joining us around 930. So we should have Billy here in about 45 minutes or, or an hour. Okay. You never know. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, Opie, I wanted to kind of get into, we've gone through the matchups, but your keys to the game. We ca- I kind of got a sense of it when you were talking to Roy Philpott, but what are a couple keys to you? I'll, I'll give you a couple of mine. Yeah. Um, stopping OK State on third down. Um, there, That's where A&M's been fantastic, uh, ranking 10th in all Power 5 schools out there. They've given up the fewest uh, rushing touchdowns in the SEC this season, seven scores allowed. Obviously, a little bit different personnel, a lot different personnel. But to me, that is a, a huge key to this game. Get the ball to Moose Muhammad. Mm-hmm. All right, this guy just scores touchdowns. Uh, here, here's something. Uh, he is on the cusp of moving into the top 15 all-time in career receiving touchdowns with 10 career scoring receptions. A guy that really hasn't been in the lineup that much. I know. it's, uh, and, and that in itself is bewildering. A guy is, as productive as you just said right. that couldn't get into the lineup. I know they've had really good receivers. Yeah. yeah. But it, it just doesn't make sense to me. A guy that productive struggles to get on the field. Um and let me give you one more. Yeah, give me another one. I expect a very pro Aggie crowd. That's what I've been reading and seeing. They they had you know, they bought all the allow, uh, allotment. Let's let's use the crowd for motivation to to help you. Let's get a little twelfth man. We've seen it at Kyle Field. Let's see if we can use it at energy. Well, you know, I want to see some energy. I want to see some energy yep. from the Aggies. Um, and, and I'm really intrigued because on the one hand, we talk about all the players that, that are starters that aren't playing, mm-hmm. right? But on the other hand, we talk about guys getting a chance. And what is it going to mean to those guys? You know, yeah. what, what does it mean to a David Hicks? To, they come say, okay, you're up. And this is your chance to make a uh, an impression. Not only are you going to do it, but you're going to do it in front of your home. Yes. There's some walk-ons out there that are probably pretty good football players. Think Travis Labhart back in ten years ago at the uh, at the uh, uh, at uh, Chick Fil A Bowl, yep. three touchdown pass. Who's to say that there's not going to be a walk-on that's going to go out and play out of his mind? You know, you 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 know maybe you're hoping, but. It's it's such a great opportunity, and I just wonder if those guys that are getting that opportunity to play, I wonder if uh, if they're going to be playing like uh, with, with all that energy, or are they coming in like just hoping to get the season over with, starting over? Well, Ob, uh, I think tomorrow we'll have hopefully a win to talk about on the, during the go hour. Always hoping for a win. Yes, no sir. matter the situation, always hoping for a win. Uh, safe travels down to uh, NRG, buddy. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to try to be safe. I don't like the way I said buddy there. Buddy. Well, I, I, it's fine with me. I, I meant it as a term of endearment. That's the way I took it. Good. When we come back on Texags Radio, John Harris, I'm assuming he is right now just like clapping his hands, getting ready. He'll be at NRG, I'm sure, if that guy doesn't miss a college football game. We'll talk to Johnny about some of the keys in the game as well. Tom Schubert in studio after that. And then Billy Lucci for an hour from 9.30 to 10.30 before Bronny. We'll have that and much, much more. It's here on Texags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
Welcome back into Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Uh, let's go straight to the era. Uh, Brian Foley Law Hotline, where we find my buddy John Harris, who's studying film as we speak. Johnny, good morning, buddy. Good morning, David. How are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? Just getting ready for the game tonight. Uh, have no idea um, who will show up on either side. So I'm very, very curious to see um, how this thing uh, goes tonight for sure. Yeah, no doubt about it, Johnny. Let's um, just... For you, I've known you a long time. I know what gets you going, and college football gets you going. In your building here over the next couple of weeks, you're going to have a bunch of games. Just how jazz does that get you? Well, I mean, this this week in and of itself, you know, started Sunday. Obviously, not a great result, but we had a game Sunday against the Browns, and we have Tax Act Texas Bowl tonight, Aggies and Cowboys tonight, and then flip the field for Sunday um, because we've got uh, Texas taking on Titans which is always a fun game. It hasn't been at home lately, but on the road, it's been great. So, but hopefully we flip it. So that's three games in eight days here. And then uh, the following week, Monday night, while we'll the national championship game here. Now that one, hopefully I'll just be attending as a fan. I hope. Um, so I'm still, I'm still uh, trying to get all my credentials in order so I can just watch that as a fan, but uh, that'll be, it'll be a crazy night if one team is involved for sure. Um, and it could be a rematch, and that's kind of what I'm expecting in some sense is a rematch um, of earlier this season, and uh, they'll play right here in uh, Jalen Milrow's backyard, so to speak. So that'll be a really – that'll be an interesting – it's interesting for – and it could be an interesting two, depending on what happens at Washington-Texas game. I mean, either way, you're going to get a really good matchup, but I think the people of Houston, obviously, and the ticket brokers here in Houston are, are really – um, hoping one particular team ends up here and comes out of this the uh, semifinal game. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if it's a rematch, I don't think Saban gets beat twice. That's just that's just how nope. I kind of look at it. No, I it, it'll. You know, it's an Alabama team that's it's interesting um, because every time you want to really count them out, well, they're not going to win this game. Well, they're not going to beat the Aggies on the road. This is the time the Aggies will get them again. They found a way. You know, Auburn's got them by the by the little ones, fourth and 31, and Milrow throws a miracle pass. Okay, Auburn can't get them. Yeah, but Georgia will get them in the SEC championship game. Nope. They play the best game of the year. The offensive line plays its best game of the year, and you just can't knock Alabama out. And now they get Michigan, and I actually think Michigan matches up. The matchup for Alabama, I think, is good because I don't know that J.J. McCarthy in the passing game could really kill Alabama. I think it's a good passing game. I don't think it's a great one. They want to rely on Blake Corum in that offensive line. And I think that fits right into what Alabama wants to do. And on the flip side, uh, I think Jalen Milrow will give that Michigan defense some issues. So uh, it very well could be Alabama, Texas. And at that point, you know, beating Saban twice in a year, uh, man, has that been, has that been done? I don't know that anybody really has got an opportunity to do it. And I don't think it's ever really happened that I could think of. So, um, you give Saban some time to prepare, and that's why I think Michigan will have some issues because Michigan, the last couple of times in the playoffs, they've just they've laid an egg against teams that you would think that they were more talented than, at least last year against TCU. Um, they were not more talented than Georgia, but either way, um, I think it's going to be a really nice playoff that's going to set up for a really good championship game here um, in Houston. And, Yo, if it's Texas, it's going to be one of the hottest tickets to get uh, in town for sure. Um, and there's a there's a part of me hoping we get that. It's part of me hoping that you know Michael Penix in Washington gets a shot at either Michigan or Alabama, and the Pac-12 ends up getting a national championship on its way out the door, which would be really kind of interesting. Johnny, not really fully understanding who's going to play for A and M today. Okay, okay, State looks like they have most of their guys going. Yeah, um, what do you think the key is for A and M? In situations like that, I always go back to you got to make sure that the operation is right. And what I mean by that is no blow on defense, no blown coverages, your line right, your assignments are right. On offense, you're not false starting, you're lining up properly. I mean, I know it sounds elementary and that every team should do it, but when you've got different pieces in the lineup all over the place, 
you know, who's at X, who's at Z, who's at Y. Well, in this formation, I'm the X, I'm the Y. I should be on the ball. I'm off the ball. I'm here. I should be going in motion, timing all that up and making sure that on 65 plays in offense and defense, that your alignment and assignment perfect. And that is just, I mean, that it doesn't seem like a high bar to cross, but when you have so many moving pieces, it's the most important bar to cross. You've got to make sure that things can function at the snap. And then at the snap, you got to just go play ball. But you've got to get to the snap, and then you can play. So this is one of those situations where you, you wonder how complex you can get with both sides of the ball, offense, defense. Um, you know, how, how varied with your defensive scheme can you get? How crazy offensively can you get through all of that? So that to me is kind of the hard part is just that very seemingly simple thing. Get to the snap. Once the snap, everybody knows what to do, then you're, then you're okay. It's just a matter of are all 11 guys on the same page and do all 11 guys know exactly what to do? And that's, and that's tough. And then if you have a guy or two that's not clued in, do you have enough depth to be able to say, hey, Jimmy, you got to go in for Joey because Joey doesn't know what he's doing. Even though Jimmy hasn't played a down of football a year, Jimmy, do you know what you're doing? Yeah, coach, I know. He goes in, he doesn't. And so all of a sudden you've got this, man, we can't even get plays off. And I go back to the LSU uh, at Kansas State, Texas Bowl a few years ago, a couple years ago. LSU was playing John Trey Kirkland at quarterback. Now, I don't think that'll be the case tonight for AM as long as Jalen's healthy. I mean, I think they'll be okay, but. There's something happens to Jalen. Oh boy. Okay. What do we do now? Cause they've been so beat up at that position. So I think that's the hard part, you know, for the coaching staff that's been around, they know what the depth chart was, but now they got to realize what the depth chart is. And okay. If I want to take this guy out, who am I putting in? And boy, do I, ooh. so you, the, the coaches have got to be in tune to all of that. The operation has to run smoothly. And with so many, I mean, I'm looking at what I think is the list of guys that are out. And I, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how you, I don't know how you suit up in certain positions. So it's going to be really interesting tonight, but talking to Elijah Robinson last night uh, at the chairman's reception, no matter to him, he's, he's coming out firing. He's getting an opportunity as interim coach and he's going to be ready to go. Talking to John Harris here on Texas radio presented by David Garner's Jules Rollo insurance studio. So last week, Jay Bateman named the uh, defensive coordinator for Texas A&M. Do you know much about him and, and, and uh, just your thoughts of he teaming up with Mike Elko? Because we know Mike's going to be the figurehead when it comes to the defense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the biggest thing, well, you just hit on it, David. First of all, just in you know, scouting and coaching circles, Jay Bateman is a, a name that's prominent, I don't know if that's the right way of saying it, but, you know, it's a, you know Jay's a respected guy. He's a respected coach. So um, I think it's a step in the right direction. I, I like what Mike did with both of his coordinators, Colin Klein and Jay Bateman. I feel like those guys are solid. And I think sometimes, you know, I had this conversation with Gerard Johnson the other day. We were kind of talking about, you know, what Mike was doing at A&M and just kind of talk about A&M in general. And, you know, I know there was so much hype with Jimbo, you know, because Jimbo had had done it. But I don't think it's a bad thing to find young, aggressive coaches that haven't done it. And what I mean by that is, you know, obviously win at a really high level. I think it's okay to have some, you know, the coaching staff that's the right coaching staff, not the most famous or the richest or, or you know, has a national championship. Have guys that are hungry, guys that you know can move up in the next two, three years. And even if you just don't know the name, that's okay. Just let these guys come in, do their job. You believe in Mike Elko, then you're going to believe in the hires he brings in. Not every single one is going to work out. Uh, not everyone will work out. And, that, and that's okay. That's kind of the way coaching is. But you just got to find the right mix of guys that works together the best. And I feel like Mike is doing that. Now, you bring up a pretty interesting question, David, and that is how much is Mike going to be involved with calling the defense or managing the defense? Is he going to allow Jay to run what Jay does? Or is Mike going to say, look, this is what we do, Jay, and this is how I want to run the defense? And I think that's going to be an interesting question um, that they're going to have to obviously work out. And 
I would imagine Jay signing with A&M means that they've come to an agreement on how they're going to do that. Um, and that's that's always a tricky thing because, well, obviously with Jimbo and Bobby Petrino, there were two guys that you know were on the offensive side of the ball, and it was always mysterious of, you know, was Jimbo still a part of it? Was he not? How is it going to go? You know, was Jimbo had did Jimbo have too much influence on Bobby? Did Bobby kind of see that? Oh, all that we all know what went on, and what didn't. Um, we'll see how it works out with Mike, but I feel like that's a big question for an offensive-minded coach with his offensive coordinator, a defensive-minded coach with his defensive coordinator. How much do you allow them to do? How much are you going to be involved? And, and that's, a, that's a tricky – it's a tricky balance. But the really good coaches find that balance. Like Saban. I think Saban, which is interesting. I think Saban – you would think, oh, Saban runs the defense. Saban calls the defense. No, he's got a defensive coordinator that – calls the defense, runs the defense, and then Saban contributes to the defense while helping the defensive backs and you know different techniques and things. Now, it's a defense that over the years that Saban has constructed, and he's kind of put it together like a paper mache project. You know, it's kind of started and built and built and built and built. So he's got this defense, and the next coordinator comes in, runs that defense, but that coordinator calls it the way he sees it and the way that he wants to call it. And Saban allows that. So if Nick Saban can do that, then I think a lot of coaches can do it. But I'm curious how Mike does that. I feel like as a first-year head coach at a and it's going to be really difficult to call all the ball plays defensively and then be on top of everything you need to be as the CEO of the program. So I like the hire of Jay Bateman. I really like the hire of Colin Klein. I think putting it together in that way, we talked about Tommy Moffitt. Uh, as a strength conditioning coach, that's always a big one. Um, so I think Mike did a really good job with hiring. And now you just got to make sure that you got the right fit over the next year, two, three, whatever, making sure you got the right fit. And I feel like going back to Saban, that's what Saban had for a long time. Saban had a really good fit with his coaches. I mean, a, there were a lot of assistant coaches that were there for a great number of years that weren't even coordinators. Um, the coordinators wanted to come in and out, but he had a really good core of position coaches that stuck around for a long time. And I think that really helps. And hopefully, you know, Mike's building something with some longevity there in College Station. A guy that I got to know pretty well that I know you know, Kareem Jackson, back with the Texans. Um, kind of got a little bit of a headhunter mentality. At least that's what the media likes to portray. Uh, just your thoughts on getting Kareem back. Yeah, love it. Love it. I mean, if he scares some people because he's back there, so be it, man. I mean, you, you'd like for it to be a no-fly zone. I mean, you know, it's a... It's an interesting league now in a sense that, you know, receivers have no problem going to the middle because they know they're not getting stuck. So, Cream's back there. You're going to think twice about it. I mean, I know DeAndre Hopkins is tough as nails, but if he knows that Kareem's back there, you know, maybe alligator arms just one of them. And that's the one that you need. So, uh, I love it. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Ward went on IR, and, you know, our safeties have not played exceptionally well for us um, when Jimmy's been out. Um, there's been some struggles at that position. The veterans that went in the other day, DHC, DeAndre Houston Carson, and Adrian Amos, they did a, they did a solid job. But I just feel like with Jimmy going on IR, they needed more. Um, so Jack comes back, and that's a good thing. And I think he's great for the locker room too, David, because you remember in 2010, that was a rough, rough, rough season. I mean, really rough. I mean, he was getting skewered. Um, here, but then 2011, Wade Phillips comes in. It's a different defense. Kareem's kind of threw his rookie year up and down, and then Kareem turned into one of the most solid Texans we've had here, uh, and I hated seeing him go. So I'm glad he's back, and hopefully this is where it finishes, um, and hopefully he can you know tack on another couple of memories, you know, like Case Keenum did against the Titans. You know, maybe Jack's got a few of those against the Titans and on into the Colts as well. Uh, but just to have an influencer back there. Uh, you know, a, a, a physical influencer that guys are like, wait, where's Jack? Because that guy will stick. You. And and I think that's good. I think that's – I don't want, you know, 15-yard penalties. And I do think there's probably a target on him from the rest. They're going to be looking for it. But I think just getting a good new start in a place that he knows and in a locker room with a lot of young guys that he can influence. And I think that would end up being a great thing for the Texans. Johnny, can you explain the whole AFC playoff scenario? Uh, I know the Texans are still in the mix, but it seems very confusing. Nope. I got no clue. <laughs> no idea. It's 
I mean, it's so confusing with the eight and seven teams because you look at the eight and seven teams and you're like, well, the Texans beat three of those teams, but then the one that's ahead of them, they lost to, but it's, oh, it's because they had that. No, it's because they're division tiebreakers and conference tiebreakers. And I, it's, it's so damn confusing. But I'll say this, David. At least we have to try and figure it out this year, as opposed to last year where we're sitting here uh, 2 12 and 1 and wondering if we're going to get the first pick in the draft or the second or what we're going to do. This is a lot better position to be in where fans, radio hosts are talking about the playoffs as opposed to, uh, well, are you guys getting Bryce Young or if you, oh, we want you to lose because you want the number one pick? This is a much better situation to be in with all, the, even with all the injuries, even with CJ out for a couple of weeks. I can't figure out the playoff scenarios, but I feel like the one thing I do know is that the playoffs start Sunday for the Texans against the Titans. They got to win that game. Then they go on the road for a, a semifinal wild card round against the Colts. Win that, they get into the wild card round against somebody Buffalo, Kansas City, whomever. Uh, and that would be pretty special. So I feel like we're in the first four uh, of the NCAA tournament. You know, we're playing in Dayton on Sunday uh, against University of Tennessee Titans. And then hopefully we can move on from there to the first round um, against Indiana, Indianapolis College, the Colts, and uh, move on from there. So it's an interesting time, to say the least. But anybody that says they know those tiebreakers are either absolute geeks, dorks, nerds, which I am one, uh, or they're just absolutely lying to you because they don't know. So hopefully we see CJ. Hopefully. Fingers are crossed. We started hearing some good things at the end of last week. Um, there was some good, good progress in the protocol. Protocol is pretty, you know, pretty, uh, it's pretty tough to get through. So hopefully at the end of it, he'll be okay. And look, you can have setbacks at any time. Michael Pittman from the Colts got all the way through the protocol, was getting ready to play last week. Uh, and then he started having some symptoms again. And so he had to go back through the protocol. So, uh, you know, fingers crossed that CJ can get through it. Uh, and then on Sunday, that this offensive line, running backs, tight ends group keeps him protected and he doesn't get touched. That's going to be the key. Doesn't matter whether we put up 500 yards or 40 points. If he gets knocked around, we got to protect him and score 21 points and hopefully beat the Titans. Johnny, I appreciate it, brother. Enjoy the game tonight. Love you, man. Love you too, brother. All right, buddy. We'll see you. See you. All right. That is John Harris there on the Brian Foley Law Hotline. When we come back, Tom Schubert in studio, chit chat a little basketball with my buddy Tom. That and more. Right now, though, we're talking Heritage Films. That's Chance McLean's company. They make documentary films about families, family businesses, family ranches. Granddad, hello, tell his story. Dad, son, like you can do a year flex and do your, your daughter, who's a freshman at AM, trying to, you know, weave her way through this world and figure out her, her major and maybe what sorority she's in and whatever activities. The year flex is the shorter option um, that Chance provides, and it's more of a 20 minute, like, Q&A form with some cool like uh, pictures and colors and just it's more like the kids communicate right the TikTokers or whatever right like you, you know what I'm talking about like it is more spoken to their language but something that the entire family can consume you also have the heritage film which is that traditional two-hour documentary done like Hollywood style the chance does and it can be for your dad your grandfather it could be for somebody important in your family or maybe like a, a family tradition or a bunch of buddies that get together and they play golf together and you want to have like every Sunday we get together and we play golf. Uh, we want to have it documented and kind of go through one of those days. Chance can do that entire thing for you. The phone number 713-893-8341, 713-893-8341. It is Heritage Films, the website again, yourheritagefilm.com.
So when I'm at the gym sometimes, I have gentlemen that stop me and they always mention how they like sometimes how I dress. And then I think to myself, if only I were Tom Schubert. <laughs> because this guy comes into the studio, Coach Tom, looking like you're coaching at Madison Square Garden tonight. <laughs> I wish. Well, I'm only here once a week, David. You're here every day, so it's easy. And I have a lot of sport coach suits, so I throw them on. You know, it's Everybody says, why are you so dressed up? But really, it's just throwing a jacket on, and, and, and that's it. So it's that simple. Well, it's, uh, it's great to have you here in studio. Merry Christmas to you. Let's uh, let's talk about first. Let's look back at the Houston Christian game. Any thoughts coming out of where the team is right now? That game in particular, kind of sloppy, but they did what they needed to do. Some uh, young guys got to play a little bit more than usual. Just your thoughts on where they are after that? Yeah, it's pretty typical. I thought uh, how they would react to that game. You know, having a disappointing loss. Uh, you know, to Houston with the great comeback. But uh, I think they're right where they need to be. Uh, ironically, we're uh, eight and four, and last year this time I think we were six and five, give or take maybe a game. So we're pretty close to where we were last year. But I think much we're, harder schedule. Absolutely, and that's the thing. Uh, you know, this net ranking. I'm not a huge fan of it, to be honest. I'm more of a results guy. Mm -hmm. Win games. You know, that's how you should be rewarded. Uh, you do have to play some tough people, and we're doing that. And I give credit to the, their coaching staff deciding to do that. You know, a lot of teams that are, have one or two losses at the most, they're playing an easy schedule. Uh, will that help them down the road? I don't know. The, the selection kid committee is so subjective, and that's the one thing I don't like about the NCAA tournament. It is important what seed you get, and hopefully this year – a&M will get a better seed if we make the tournament, which right now we're on schedule to do. And our net is wonderful. I mean, uh, we're in the, right now we'd probably be a top four to five seed in the NCAA tournament. When you watch this team play, there's a couple things that pop out that I, I'm not a huge fan of. One of those is sometimes shot selection. But is that the way teams are playing A&M, forcing them into maybe some, some shots that they wouldn't normally take? Or do you think they're just trying to find their rhythm? I think it's a combination. I think the first one you said, teams are trying to make us take difficult shots. Secondly, I think we're taking some quick shots. And I, my reasoning behind it is we have a lot of players that are similar in ability, maybe with the exception of Boots and, uh, and Wade, our, you know, maybe our, our two elite guys, and Henry. Uh, but when those guys come off the bench that aren't playing much, uh, they want to get more minutes. And sure. so I think in their mind, they're pressing a little bit. It's not a negative thing. I would be the same way. Uh, they want to score, make some points, and it looks good to Coach Williams, and then he gives them more time. The thing that's happening, I think they shoot it a little quicker than they should. They're not in rhythm. They start missing. They press even more. Next thing you know, their statistics are awful. I mean, we've got really good shooters, in my opinion, and you can watch them in practice. You can watch them in games and warm-ups. They can make open shots. they got great form. Uh, they've proved it at other schools and even at A&M. And then they start missing, and they're shooting in the 20s, low 20s. Right. And we're as a team, we're 42 from the field and 28 from the three. We're a better shooting team than that. So there's something. It's not all the other team's defense. I think our shot selection needs to improve. And what about the lineup? And, and I made this comment yesterday. I, I'm at a point when January 1st comes, I'm not looking at when Boots is coming back or if Julius is coming back. By the, when January 1st comes – that's just our team, and anything that comes afterwards. But there's still a little bit of hope that both guys, or you know, Boots especially, but maybe Julius. So just your thoughts on how they're running the lineup. Uh, I think coaches try to figure out how to win with what they have. You know, they're not worried about when Boots. I mean, they, they would love to have Boots back soon. But, you know, they're trying to win games with the lineup they have. I think it's a perfect analogy of what you're saying. So in the elite teams, find a way to win regardless. And that's why I think – the last couple of years, we've been, you know, successful because we found a way to win. Our, you look at our stats sometimes, they're not something to brag about, but we're making key shots, we're making big free throws, we're getting a stop when we need it. And that's what we did going 15-3 and three last year. We made big plays when they were needed. As we talked, I'm fearful. I don't know if we can go 15-3. and three. I mean, I'd take 12-6 and six right now and mm -hmm. think it's a great year, and that would get us in the tournament. But, uh, yeah, good teams find a way to win regardless of who they have out there. I'm sure you, you've recognized this. This fan base isn't just okay with just making the tournament. This is a veteran team. That being said, a veteran team that's missing some pieces. 
Sure. And uh, again, uh, sometimes, you know, missing a piece for a while helps your team down the road. You know, guys get opportunities. I was hearing the broadcast earlier about, you know, football teams that maybe guys don't decide not to play in the bowl. They're going to step up these new guys. Mm-hmm. And that's the way they can get more playing time. And I think we have a team full of that. I just wish some of them would relax a little bit more. And I think we'll find a way to, or A&M will find a way to get that chemistry and start playing elite basketball. How does the coach get a team to relax? Like, what is like the, the, is there scenarios or is it just by experience? Well, I think experience has a lot to do with it. And then maybe communication, Uh you know, young people, you sometimes assume what they understand. You know, if you were to tell a player, you know, the best way to get more playing time, what I was always told as a player when I was coming off the bench or whatever from a coach is that you, you do, you perform on the field or on the court the next thing you know, you get more minutes and you keep doing that. And before you know it, you're out there more than you're not out there. So I think guys need to understand it's not all about the big statistics. Anderson Garcia, I think he accepts his role better than any guy mm-hmm. in the team. He's, he's shooting in low 40s from the field, but he's almost our leading rebounder. So he's an elite rebounder. He doesn't care about any of the other statistics, and he just goes out there and does his job. And really basketball is a, is kind of a role sport you know every guy gets a role and if you do your role and everybody does it well you're going to have a good season and a good team so we know all buzz williams teams are going to have good chemistry in the locker room do you like the chemistry you're seeing on the court uh personally not as good as i think it could be i i wish we'd be a little more i don't think we have selfishness but i wish we'd make extra passes you know i i watch elite teams come in here and play us when they have a chance to win or when uh, we're on the road and the more passes you make, and it's been proven, the higher statistics you're going to have in shooting. Now, not that shooting high, high percentage means you're going to win, but I think it gives you a greater opportunity. One of the reasons we're an elite uh, offensive rebounding team, we miss a lot of shots, you mm-hmm. know. So if you make your shots, you're not going to have a lot of offensive rebounding opportunities. But I wish we'd just be a little more patient and make more passes. And, again, it's easy to be critical sitting in the stands. I'm not in practice every day. I don't know the players. I will say this, what Coach Williams does is he gives players confidence. You know, he's not a guy to yank you after making a bad pass or taking a tough shot. He's going to live with you and give you another opportunity. And as a player, they love that. What's the conversation like uh, during the game? And afterwards, I think when you're watching film, but like during the game, when, when somebody's taking some erratic shots or maybe not making that pass that could have led to an easier shot? It's a great question, David. You know, it's hard to be great at everything. So I don't know of any teams that are. You might have one every 20 years that does everything well. I mean, if you were to ask oppositions and coaches, and I have, you know, I used to ask when I was coaching my buddies, what, do, what, what are we doing good as a team? You know, you don't really want to hear your negatives. But I, I think we're a lead on defense. You know, we play extremely hard. I think they would say we were very unselfish, the Aggies are. But I think shot selection and offensive efficiency are our downfall right now. And when you're playing great teams, it's hard to win when you're, you're not executing at that level. All right, I'm going to ask you this, NBA and college basketball-wise, best team you've ever seen play? Wow. It could be uh, on TV. It doesn't have to sure. be Sure. Uh, college basketball, you know, when I was a young man, UCLA's teams went undefeated. You know, I played for Jerry Tarkanen at UNLV. That's the one I was going to say, the, yeah. The, the 91 team that lost to Larry Duke. Johnson yeah, and yeah. Stacey Ogman, yeah. Had they won, and that's a big if, but if they had won the uh, that game and won the national championship, I think arguably they They won the year before, right? They did. Yeah. And they beat Duke 30 and then lost, you know, in a close game in the semifinals. But there's so many great teams. And then, again, it's easy to uh, pick people apart, you know, what they don't do well. It's always interesting. Coaches, when they're good at something uh, and they're not good at something else, they, like, are critical. And uh, uh, what I wasn't good at as a coach, I always admired what other people do, like rebounding. Coach Williams has the Aggies rebounding at a level that's as good as anybody in the country. And I don't know how to do that as a coach. I don't. You know, there's many guys that can. But uh, we're, we're doing some good things. Uh, we just got to settle down. And then we need to make big shots when yeah. they're needed, you know. And uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, uh, I know we open up, uh, got one more game, and then we uh, play uh, our conference play. So it'll be interesting. 
All right, the uh, I think it was 97 Bulls or the 20 whatever Warriors that won 73, which didn't win the, the championship, by the way. Right, but right. We, the Warriors at their best or the Bulls at their best? Oh, I'm going to go with the Bulls. Thank I think, you. yeah, I'm a you, Chicago you guy. And you're yeah. a Michael Jordan fan, yeah. I know. So, yeah, he, he is, uh, yeah, he was probably the GOAT. But, uh, again, the, all that is subjective, you know. You, but the nice thing about it is that you can – uh, agree or disagree about it and still have fun with it. Hey, one thing about the UNLV team, then we'll, we'll, we'll hit a break here in a second, but uh, I really, if Larry Johnson could have stayed healthy, man. I mean, he's still, he stayed healthy enough to be a great contributor, but I thought he was on that Barkley kind of ascend. He was, you know, he played hard, you know, and uh, he just wanted to win. That's yeah. what I loved about him. We were just at a reunion that uh, Mrs. Tarkanian had. He was there. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I didn't play with him or coach him or anything, but I, I spoke with him. What a nice guy. You know, he yeah. spent a lot of time in New Skyline York. Skyline Dow. I think he's from Skyline Yeah, yeah, he yeah. is. Yeah, sure is. And he has a home in New York and one in Vegas. You know, he played with the Knicks for a yeah. long time. Yeah, he was a, a coach's dream because, you know, you knew you were going to get great effort every night. His numbers were going to be good. And he liked the kind of the blue collar style. You know, he'd yeah. guard the best, other team's best player. And he always was going to grab some rebounds. One last thing, A&M wise, are you considering everything they've gone through and considering the trajectory bus teams typically go when the conference play starts? Are you okay with where they are right now? I am, sure. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to have more wins. But again, uh, when you're up there at the top, you're ranked or, you know, people are gunning for you. So sometimes, you know, you got to slipping in the back door, coming in from behind, kind of like we've done in a, a few years. Uh, it, it's a little bit easier, yep. but it, it's going to be, uh, it's not going to be easy. I, I, I don't know who's going to win the SEC. Do you have a, an opinion on that? Well, if, it's funny you say, asked that because two weeks ago, I was like, the SEC sucks this year. And now I'm looking at it. They're all good. They're all right around nine and three, eight and four. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's up for grabs. I think A and M, Tennessee, Kentucky. Are, oh, Miss is pretty darn good. Yeah. Oh, he's doing a tremendous job over there. Sure is. Yeah, they, they've had enough success. Done with that. All right, <laughs> Tom. Happy New Year, buddy. Same to you, David. Thank you. Millican Reserve Time Farm to Table Community and College Station. They got homes. They got trails. They got wide open spaces with a mission to build a healthy community around nature. And they've done that by creating a sanctuary for family, for nature, and for community. 2,600 acres of open space, 30 miles of trails and homes that connect families to nature and to each other. An extensive network of trails throughout a wooded landscape. And I'm telling you, it is a wonderful place to just go connect and hang out and go hiking with your family, biking, canoeing, kayaking. They got equestrian trails. They've got evening yoga. They got summer camps. They got music festivals. They got farmer market tours. It's an incredible place just to go hang out with your family, but you can also live there. Real estate out there. They got the creek. Uh, th those are homes on 10 plus acre wooded estates. You've got the hollow in a private gated community, and you've got the meadows. Homes at the meadows are responsive for their natural surroundings. Check out the website, millicanreserve.com. That's millicanreserve.com.
Welcome back into Texas Radio, presented by David Garner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Billy is in the office somewhere. We'll get to him here momentarily. I see a bunch of you watching on YouTube. Do me a favor. Can we get more likes, guys? We got 332 of you guys watching right now, and we only got 45 likes. Can we get those over 100, especially on a bowl game, guys? I know we started off the show, or yesterday, talking about bowls have kind of lost their importance, but it's a game day. It matters now. It should matter to you. That's why you're watching the show, right? Like, uh, it, it's going to matter. So let's get those numbers up, help promote the channel, subscribe to the channel as well, trying to get to uh, 14,000 subscribers by the start of the new year. Uh, a lot to get into here over the next uh, hour with Billy, and then we'll start off with uh, Bronny at 1035. Billy, good morning, buddy. Morning, David. What happened? No, I just had an interesting conversation with Nick. About? Y'all's basketball game. What, my destruction? Well, a couple... Oh, I know what you're going to pick on. Me warming up beforehand, getting my hamstrings ready. Yeah, because I am an older man. Go lunges ahead. and air boxing when he pulled up. Shadow boxing and lunges to, to play basketball. I, I have a routine that I do to get ready. Yeah. You really were. Hey, I thought he was exaggerating. No, he, I did it. You're shadow boxing. I, I do it every day. I do. Was that an intimidation tactic? I mean, like if he to, took it that way, sure. But no. Then I, I have a routine. He said that you were playing at a level 11 and he was playing at like a five. Well, and that, to me, that part, I don't, I'll put that's, that that's on. on that's him. on him. Yeah. I do everything 100 miles an hour. And, but then he said that you were doing like pump fakes, like, yeah, 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 like sound effects. And, yeah, so, but what I don't understand that, the problem with it. What was that going to do? I just make, make him jump. I sound? make sound effects when I hoop. Oh, yeah, he did jump, and he fell. In fact, did he tell you about the last play of the game? No, he did not. Oh, the last play of the game, that's exactly what I did. I did a pump fake. Mm -hmm. He went up in the air. He fouled me. I threw it up. Went in. Game over. And destroyed. One. You could have run it up yeah. with a free throw. We could have played to 100, and he wouldn't have scored more than three points. Really? It was that 100%. Yeah. Now, I, now I know why Calvin Murphy hates your ass. His ass got shut down. <laughs> he would have taken me, though. Calvin Murphy. <laughs> How are you, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. Hey, Ready uh, to head to Houston. What time are you leaving? I don't know, Whenever. Matter. Just, I mean, I'm. We're gonna go do a dinner beforehand, so I'm gonna get down there around three or so. Yeah. You know, I'm looking forward to. Not, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to today. I'm looking forward to tonight. Just seeing some. You know, like I really root for Jalen Henderson, mm -hmm. and I really want to see him go out, and, and I'd love to see a, a fun night of offense for these guys. Look, I know there's much has been made, and I, I, several days later, you know, after the fact, after we posted it, you know, much has been made about the lack of bodies at receiver for AM, and I mean, it's, it's a legitimate concern. They're pretty healthy in the backfield. And they got a guy named Ruben Owens, Amari Daniels. Le'Veon Moss has kind of been in and out, so that one will be interesting. I'll do a little more digging today to see if he's going or not. Um, at, but but they got some quality and and guys that could have big games at running back. Mm -hmm. Jalen Henderson is going to be making in what his fourth start. Uh, his last one, he was on the road at LSU, played really outstanding well. football for three quarters there. Um, looked great in an SEC game against Mississippi State. Like I'm excited to see what he does. Um, and their offensive line is. Fairly intact. Now you lose Layden, who's not going to go. But otherwise, Naboo's been banged up in and out. But it's fairly intact. I mean, I think you could see potential starting line of Zune, Dewberry, Bryce, Bryce, Besantis, and uh, Crownover or Fathery. Like so. I mean, I think you've got you've got a nice offensive line. You got running backs. You got tight end will be will be limited, but Max Wright has been it's a bizarre. guy all year. He's been rock solid all year. What you, what you can't afford on offense are any injuries. You don't have depth there. Um, and then at receiver, look, Moose Muhammad might decide, I want to go out there and have a big game tonight in a bowl game. He seems fired up based on you know his posts, and, and yeah. he's, he's giving it a go. He's going to be out there. You've got Micah Tease, and, and who's a true freshman I'm excited about seeing, and then Jade Walker. So between Moose and Jade, those are two guys that in the last few weeks have proven they can go 100, 
on any given Saturday. I mean, Moose has proven that during his career today here of late. So you you got enough. Where I worry is is about is defense, and in particular uh, at corner. That corner position worries me. Um, D line. I don't. I got to check on Shamar Turner. I think he's still mulling that NFL NFL A and M decision. It's not a transfer decision. It's an A and M NFL decision. So he might. I, I'm not expecting him, but I should double check that before we post it. Um, but without him, then you're without him. You'd be without obviously uh, Nolan. You're without Diggs. You're without Rakes. So you're looking at re in, on the inside guys like. Regis, Dindy, Hicks, Samu, uh, and is light, but Shamar Stewart is out there. Started all, you know, most of you, you got uh, Rylan Kennedy, mm -hmm. you've got Malik Silla. So you've got some guys, but again, not nearly as much depth. And you're going, and, and at linebacker, you feel all right about your starting two of York and Chris Russell a veteran who's played a ton of football, and then you'll get to see some of the younger guys. But that's a tall task in that front seven against Ollie Gordon, assuming he goes, and it sounds like that's their plan. At corner, that's why I think you could have a real issue. Um, but it's, it's a chance for these young guys to step up. Look, Javon Thomas and, and McCall have played, I wouldn't say a lot of football this year, but they were thrown into the fire at times. So if they've been getting ones reps this whole time, they ought to be a little more prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know you're going to see a lot probably of Bravey on Rogers as well, and also maybe even Robinson walk on number forty two. So corner is what worries me most, and and defense in general. Um, but it's a chance for some young guys to really make a statement, and not even so much young like Malik Silla. Hey, like. Impress your new coaches. Go out in, in Houston, your hometown, and go get a couple sacks. Shamar Stewart, show that you're ready to take the next step and be an all-SEC performer in Elko's defense next year, which I think he could be really good with, at that big end spot that Elko loves so much. You saw guys like Leal. You saw Bobby Brown man that position. You've seen Clemens. Like, leave on a high note. DJ Hicks, Gabe Brownlow Dindy. Those guys are five-star recruits. They've done nothing to show that they're that they're not good players, but they could show a lot on on. Uh, I was about to say on Saturday tonight to say, hey, while you're all worried about the Walter Nolans of the world, don't forget who's still on campus, right. and and that's two guys with ten stars beside their name coming out. And Hicks, as a true freshman, just kind of saw his playing time doing this. Dindy seems like a guy that's just been waiting on an opportunity. For the outgoing staff tonight, does it kind of how does that work? Does it end tonight? They they, they get back and yeah, they I move think, on. I think that's I think they're they'll be done after that. Um, and Elko, the Elko staff. I've been saying this, and and you know I've, I've said who I believe's coming over from Duke, and that would leave. Uh, no one mentions him, and I've been mentioning him. You know, not that it's a sure thing, but I think the tight ends coach Darty, uh, tight end special teams will be coming over as well. Okay, so that leaves you with safeties and and receiver coach. That's the way I think Elko's defensive staff is going to break out. You're going to have corner and safety, and that may end up being uh, that could end up being BGA. You could see him in an analyst type role if they want to make a hire there from the outside. Um, but so maybe safeties, maybe not, but safety and wide receiver, and that would be pretty much it. Special teams? And I've tied in special teams. Tied in yeah. special teams, okay. Yeah. So, um, and that's normal for those one. We don't have a specialty. That's actually a normal thing that you do. That's actually his background. Okay. And uh, that's how mo a lot of schools would do it over time. Uh, I think, I'm trying to think. Yeah, that's what Brian Polian did here when Sumlin came in. He was thought of as kind of a special teams ace. That's what Jeff Banks did, tight end special. That's that's right. pretty normal because you're really coaching like four guys, you know, one one spot out of the eleven and four guys, and that's kind of how that works. But so I think, yeah, he might have only two hires to make, and I I'm 
got it on pretty decent authority that that number is probably down to one. Okay. Uh, so not uh, basically not much to do. Once you have a full staff, yeah, those guys. This tonight will be uh, their last night working, and then they'll go get jobs. And I think I think they've cleared out a lot of uh, a lot of the support staff as well. And I think it's it's going to be a, a pretty complete. Pretty complete overhaul, yeah. which I think is – like individually I could go through and say, man, that, that one uh, – you hate to see that happen. You hate to see it happen to anybody. There's a lot of people over there that I don't know. There's no personal connection. So I sh- you, know, you say you don't care, but you do because it's people you know, having to find new work around the holidays. That's the nature of the profession. And that I sucks. always say with coaches, I understand. Like, man, most of them make more money than – 99% of the people listening, 99.9% of the people listening in today's college football. It's never easy to be told, hey, you're being let go on any level. But I think more of the, the, the up-and-comers, the young people in the profession that are trying to work their way up, and then there's an overhaul. But I think it's, it also is what needs to be done when you're coming in and there's a program that's not one the way it has. This is not, even though Mike Elko has been here, this is not a promotion from within because your coach left voluntarily and things are rolling along. This right. is not Lincoln Riley being brought up at OU. This is not, you know, Freeman being brought up at Notre Dame. This is something that you went eight, you went eight and four, you went five and seven, you went seven and five, like, and then fired a coach. So uh, I'm ready for the fresh start after tonight, though, but I'm ready to see these guys play tonight. And, and I know a lot of these coaches have been guys like like Coley. Yep. You know, they're putting a lot into this game in terms of schemes and what they're going to try to do offensively. Coley and Chaney in particular, defensively, Dirk and still their work. And so it's, it's fun for them, and it should be fun for the players as well. Super short segment coming back. It's Tex Hacks Radio.
Super short segment here, like 45 seconds short. Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Johnny Graham on the YouTube page says, uh, Gordon, 13 for 34, talking about Ollie Gordon, against Texas. I know they are loaded up front, but so are we. Uh, should, we should be able to match. Hope so. Different faces. Guys getting some new experience, but it'll be great to see that. Uh, Richard sends in, uh, hope we see some pleasant surprises tonight. Ags 35, OSU 10. I don't know what to expect. I don't. I think the offense is going to do what we've seen the last three or four weeks. I think it'll be similar. Look, without Anaya Smith, the guy that you could count on. All, but I think the offense is going to be okay tonight. I do. I do think the offense is going to be okay. The big question is going to be on the back end. Can the corners cover? Can they, do they have enough experience in the limited time that they've played to do a, a good job? Um, and obviously, can you limit Ollie Gordon somewhat? Can you keep him under 100? Get your offense rolling? You win that game. All right, hour number three up ahead here on Tex-Ax Radio. We'll talk to uh, Billy. I want to get some thoughts on Jay Bateman from him. Also, um, maybe a little Evan Stewart to Ole Miss, a little bit of that rumor. That and more is Tex-Ax Radio.
We are back, Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. You guys got some questions for Billy. You can ask those. We'll try to get him for, I think, an hour tomorrow after the game to kind of wrap up the season overall, maybe go through some player evaluations. If you got some questions, though, uh, you can text us in at 979-693-1150. He's now holding court there in the lobby. Uh, we've talked a little, well, a lot about the game, and uh, we will continue to do so. I do want to get Billy. I wasn't here last week when some of the news broke out there uh, on Jay Bateman and Derek Miller, the new uh, GM recruiting uh, director of recruiting. So I want to ask him about that. And also this Nick Scorton uh, defensive end out of Purdue who's in the portal and he's got ties to the area from Bryan, Texas. And, uh, you know, um, I saw somebody post that he follows a lot of our Aggie players. He's going to take some visits. So maybe get some thoughts from Billy and from Bronny a little bit later on that. And uh, Evan Stewart flirting with Ole Miss, one of the three destinations he's looking at. Nick, do you remember the three? It's It's, it's Oregon, Ole Miss, and Georgia, I believe. Does that sound right? Sorry, I was not okay. listening. <laughs> but Billy's in there. Uh, Billy. Billy, Evan Stewart, I, I saw Where Ole Miss, there? Georgia, and Oregon, I think, the three teams that he's talking to. Was Georgia the third one? Uh, man, I could be wrong. Um, You saw that. I don't even know how accurate it is, but... um. USC and Georgia were two teams. I definitely got the vibe from Evan. Even, you know, I think the last interview I did with him, I just had a feeling like it just felt like he was, he wasn't checked out because he was going to, he was, he actually was engaged and, you know, but it just felt like just certain things came up and I was like, okay, if he transfers, that doesn't have a Texas feel like everyone's always thought. I was getting a USC Georgia feel, okay. but I mean, Ole Miss is going to try to get involved with every high profile kid in the portal. That's their MO. Lane's going to try to get involved with every A and M kid. Could you imagine the conversations he tr- he'll try to have with guys like Evan and Walt, and you know, just to try to kind of he's got to be so uh, clearly so obsessed with the whole. A and M NIL process. I can't imagine what kind of, you know, digging and infiltrating he's kind of tries to do. That's probably half of why he wants to sign guys. Yep. Guys like that are extremely talented. So was Chris Marshall. So was Denver Harris. I don't think Walt and Evan not are that of that. Of, yeah. They're not that at all. I don't think either one of those guys are like off the field bad. I don't think they're bad character I think they in some ways A&M won't miss you know what they have but also at the same time you can't miss just what shrug be. off like what what potential Elko and a new receivers coach and Colin Klein and a new system or a new defensive coordinator in Bateman or a new position coach in, in Sean Spencer like I don't, you know, we all say Elijah's the best D-line coach that we've seen come through here, and and I've always said that combo of him and TP was the best I've seen, and I stand by that. I'm not walking that back. I think Elijah's a terrific coach and mentor for those young guys, but who knows if Sean Spencer could have got to Walt differently Mm -hmm. and just in a different way. Who knows if – Walt, going into his junior year, saw dollar signs and said, this is my one and done. I, I'm going to string together 12 incredible games and, and give it my best. I'm skeptical of that based on an entire, you know, two-year body of work here. I'm very skeptical right. about mm-hmm. it. Um, I think it'll take a lot to keep Evan happy in terms of touches and stuff, but Lane and Ole Miss have done a good job of getting touches to the, so I mean I think I think Evan could in, in the right space really thrive. I, he, it's like a lot of receivers. It's not just him. There's a bunch of them, and if they don't get touches, they have a hard time with that. Yep. Because it's not running back. It's not quarterback. Tight ends for whatever reason don't seem to be that way. I think they feel like what they get is is you know, just added bonus in 2023 in today's style of offense. But 
receivers that don't get touches, it's tough, especially five stars that don't. And it happens everywhere, you know? So you're not losing what you saw on the field. You're losing what could be. But there's also a decent chance that what could be is exactly what you've seen, which is, you know, Evan, you know, has he's – oft injured I think he needs to be in a slot you put him in a slot position give him a little space to operate I think he could be pretty lethal which is why I hope he leaves the SEC I'd love to see him at a USC type of spot but somewhere away from yeah the SEC but at least with Ole Miss Georgia teams like that you're not playing them next year but uh you know there's a chance that nothing changes and they're pretty good players when they're healthy and out there. Walt has left a ton of games injured only to come right back. Um, but you lost real talent there. And they're not bad no matter what anyone thinks. And, yeah, do I hate the, the, the game of just – it's not these two guys, but everyone just, sure. hey, I'm going to go get the most I can get, and I don't care about – School team and the school ultimately doesn't care about an individual player. We like to think as Aggies we care more than other fan bases about their play. I, I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think when they leave, they leave. You know, like Kyle Allen went and bettered himself and and had an NFL career. I don't see anybody running around claiming Kyle Allen and you know Aggies bending over backwards to, you know, like it's right. just it, it's football. It's college football. It's a business. It actually always has been a business. I think if you stay at A&M, you graduate from A&M, and you're an Aggie, it's different. I do think that's different. I think that network is different when you're done. So like a guy like Chase Lane or Haynes, like yeah, they're – well, Chase Chase graduated. for sure. Chase for sure. Like even like a Fidel Diggs graduated. graduated. Yeah. You know, like he – Devin Price, and then there's a million other reasons there. Devin <laughs> Price is going to Ole Miss. We haven't heard a peep about that. You know, like, it's, it's different. Um, but, like, while they're here, I don't think the fans care more to the point that, like, hey, we cared so much about you and then you turned your back. No, you cared they were a great football player, you know, or that could have been a great football player. They were a blue-chip recruit. That's where the level of, you know, like, you're hand-wringing more about Walter Nolan, not because – you're invested and care so much about him. Same with Ole Miss. Nobody in Oxford gives a damn about Walter Nolan other than he's going over there to hopefully win them football games. That's college football. That's the business. So if, if a two-star that hadn't played it down yet at A&M transferred, no one would really say anything. Right. Our message boards would not melt down. Twitter would not have visceral reactions. So it's not, oh, my gosh, they, they care so much more, but it's about – I don't like just leaving your teammates behind your, you know, just kind of like you're at the finish line there with one year to go. It's some familiarity with coaches coming. And it, there are certain instances where it definitely does feel like you're going, you know, as some people like to say, bag chasing. Well, if you're going to play more, if you're going because Elijah Robinson's like a second father to you, if you're going – because Jimbo got fired and you don't know the new coach, you know, like all those things, Max Johnson was not going to start at quarterback here this year. You get it. Going to try to pursue a career down the road in football. Or maybe he just wants to play one more year. There's a lot of different guys that, you know, again, I mentioned Diggs. How about Isaiah Rakes? Right. Came down here, gave four years. Might have started because of attrition, but certainly no type of guarantees from the Northeast. Like, I get it. Some of these, though, it definitely does feel like, you know, I'm going to chase. Well, and, and I'll tell you this. In Evan Stewart's deal, yeah, I'm sure he's going to look for the biggest, like the best NIL situation he can get. But Evan stayed two years, and I'm not – I'm not uh, – I think he should have been more durable. I think, there, you know, it always felt like social media, there were games being played and stuff. But – but he, he kind of liked leaving it out there that he might leave. I, I, I don't I appreciate that. But as a player, he had two solid years here. Had the potential for more, but he, I think he felt like he was misused, not 
you know, we had a glut of slots. One was a veteran senior team leader and inspirational leader and producer in Anias. That was Moose's best spot and it's Evan's best spot. I think there was some, you know, recruiting mistakes there. You needed a little bit more on the outside, a little less at you know, this glut at slot. So Evan was out there. I think he's probably looking for a better position for his talents. And, and also in Colin Klein, maybe he didn't, he was unsure that it was going to work for him. I think he could have, I think he could have had a monster year this year. I hate, look, I, I'm going to say this, and you, you may disagree, but there are a couple of players that, if you would have told me December 14th, 2021, that they're going to transfer, two of the guys that we just talked about would have been the first ones on my mind. There was something 21 about 21. 21. After that, yeah. Yeah, the 22 yeah, class. There was you. something about that recruitment that was like, I just, there's something about it that made me feel, I yeah. don't know. I, yeah, when you just don't feel like it was. Yeah, I know what you're saying, though. It's not like it didn't like feel like York, they were ever just completely married to it. Right. Yeah. Tori and York felt like an Aggie to me. Like, yeah. just that whole, yeah. the, the whole, and I'm not saying Evan, Evan was great. I talked to him here a couple of times. He was mm-hmm. a super polite kid, but just, I think the social media act and all that made me think, mm, if there's somebody who's going to transfer, yeah, no, one I, of the first I think, I think that's, I think there's certainly, uh, there's certainly truth in that. And it's just like, but today it's also so easy for these guys to do that. Look, Oklahoma State's going to have Ollie Gordon running for him tonight. Doak Walker award winner. We haven't even broken down that, that aspect of this matchup. I mean, that's a – and was playing arguably the best back in the country tonight. Yeah. With a completely depleted defense. I mean, this is trouble for the – they're going to have to – Jalen Henderson and that offense are going to have to score. Oklahoma State has a veteran quarterback. They've got a receiver out there running around that played the last time A&M played in a bowl game. I believe he scored a touchdown in that game. So this is a tough matchup. If the Aggies can win this bowl game, if you're Mike Gundy, i got to be like, what? <clears throat> and I know he's not. He's been there so long. But you'd have to wonder if he's like, what am I doing here? Yeah. What exactly am I doing? And you got to look at like somebody like Elaine Kiffin or – these guys that have moved around and go, I just stayed here. Did I stay too long? Because if Oak State can't beat A&M tonight, and I know there's a plethora of Longhorn fans who are just waiting with my tweets about how bad Oak State, first of all, Oak State, yeah, they got routed by South Alabama. They got routed by UCF. Mm-hmm. They also were playing that bowl game Ollie Gordon was banged up and completely ineffective against Texas, and he was hurt. He was on, off, on, off. This is an A and M team that's, it's like the, it's like the practice squad. It's like you're going in there playing. A lot of it is going to be like the practice squad. If this A and M team were to beat Oak State tonight, man, that would be a damning indictment. And it sucks to say that because this is where bowl games have gotten. Yep. When you have a coaching change, it's like virtually no chance. What I hope happens is I hope that they have effort like they did in that bowl game against Wake Forest. I hope they have effort like they did in that bowl game against Northwestern when they did win. They did win a bowl. But see, what happened then is you had a future first-round pick in Ryan Tannehill playing. Nowadays... Ryan Tann and Tannehill might, but those guys don't play in bowl games. No, they Look don't. at Jaden Daniels. Like those dudes, you know, Johnny wasn't going to the NFL, but look at Johnny had something to prove in that bowl game against OU. Like that game mattered. I'm not even sure how much a cotton bowl and, and Did the, the Duke sugar game matter? Duke. Uh, I mean, no. He, he played his no, butt off in that second half. It didn't matter. And he went out there and played and, and was jumping over people, putting his body at risk. Mike Evans played in that game. Mm-hmm. He was leaving. Christian Kirk played against Wake Forest. Miles Garrett played against Kansas State in, the, in this Texas Bowl. So we've got examples of guys doing it. And, and you'll have a – will we have any tonight? I don't think so. I think Anias would have played. If he was healthy. But Edge isn't playing. Layden's not playing. Damani's not playing. Um, and then you have all the transfers. Uh, Max Wright's playing. There's not a lot of guys, though, that are on the way out 
that are playing that are playing in this game. Right. And and I don't even know that I blame. I mean, times have changed. I don't want to be old guy sitting here going, "Well, you know, back in my day, Miles Garrett played. Miles wasn't even in my day." It's changes by the by the year almost, and and when it's being coached by guys that are out the door, when it's being, you know, like it's just, it's hard to blame anyone, but I, it, but it you don't do- have to like it though. No, I hate the whole setup. I think they need to figure out something. It's going to get even less meaningful when you have the 12 team mm-hmm. playoff, but it does make me appreciate the guys that do play infinitely more. And that's why I still remember Christian Kirk playing in that book. And I still remember miles Garrett I still remember Johnny and Mike doing that. It it tells you a little bit more about what those guys are made of and how much they like playing football. And and like we go back to the transfer portal guys, it also says how much you care about your teammates and how much probably that you know they care about you. See, I'd have a much harder time leaving behind a program where if I knew those guys in the locker room really cared about me. Yeah. So I was like, man, I love them. But I also know how much they love me. I don't want to leave that. That's a tie that binds. And, and obviously, in a couple notable instances, that wasn't the case here. Hey, before we hit a break, let me just ask one last thing about Lane. If that scenario that I believe you were one of the first ones to say it out loud, where Brian Kelly were to potentially go to Michigan if Harbaugh were to leave, Lane would be crazy to. I think he would he'd be a better place for him as LSU, right? Yeah, yeah. But but he would be crazy to leave that roster. That he, I mean, what, would he flirt with that idea at this point? I wouldn't put anything past him. I wouldn't put anything past him from a you know uh, not being appreciative standpoint. Because remember, they hired him from what Florida Atlantic. Atlantic. Yep. Um, yeah, I wouldn't put anything past him. The only thing he seems to be appreciative of is is Nick Saban. I think he was that close to taking Auburn and leaving them at the altar. So why why wouldn't you do that for LSU? And I know he's got a squad. He's not only got a squad, he's got the schedule and the, the squad. schedule and the squad, yeah. And look, he's a good coach. He's proven that. I don't I don't think he's a good coach. Uh I don't think he's a good coach to work for. I don't know how much that matters. If you've proven you can just rotate, you know, have a rotating turnstile of coaches coming in and keep it going and, and you're the main cog of it, so be it. The results speak for themselves. The results at – everybody talks about uh, what Sark did there. It's what Lane did there at Alabama that really got that going. Mm-hmm. The results at F- F- FAU, the results in Oxford. Like, he gets it done, okay? I do think he needs to win more meaningful games there. I think he's won – LSU this he's, year. he's gotten a lot of runoff beating A and M and talking about it, but those are again those are three A and M teams that win a combined what they're like four games over five hundred in those three years. You know, it, it wasn't a mass as much as we'd love it to be. It wasn't a big accomplishment. Um, the LSU game this year, that's damn near it. That Tennessee win with the mustard and the golf ball. The Tennessee was like that was like a six and six, seven and five Tennessee team. So. But this is what it's built to, like you said. I'm really interested, just from an A&M standpoint, and forget about uh, Kiffin, from an A&M standpoint, I'm really interested. Like, yeah, what if Harbaugh leaves? And what if Kelly goes there? What does LSU do? What, what does Michigan – like, the, yeah. the, I'm just saying, for a team like A&M, what does that second wave of the portal look like? I'm not saying the Aggies are going to be LSU East or Michigan South. But I'm saying there's going to be a lot of guys that are going to be kind of twisting in the wind just like these A&M players were, and it'd be another opportunity for the Aggies and Elko to go out and get – maybe you can get two, you know, meaningful additions from the portal from that type transition. And, again, I go back. Had A&M had two portal corners this past season that that were – High-end performers. Season looks different. High-end performers. Like, second team, honorable mention, all-conference guys. Chappelle level? Chappelle and, and one other. Chappelle and two others. Mm-hmm. Um, you, I think you 
look, you, 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 beat, you beat Ole Miss. You lost to them on the last play, as it was. Miami probably looks totally different because they scorched your corners mm-hmm. in that game. Um, Alabama, obviously, you got – cooked for 200 yards by Burton and, and a couple touchdowns at a minimum. And that doesn't even say if you could have the corner situation shored up against Tennessee, does that change the way you defend the run where they ran all over you? So let's leave that one out and let's even leave LSU out where, look, the difference in that game down the stretch was they, well, was Jaden, but they couldn't cover, they couldn't cover Brian Thomas and Malik neighbors. Right. They couldn't coming across the field. Simple, you know, crossing patterns were going for 30, 35 yards. The fades, they were in, you know, sometimes even in decent coverage, but you couldn't stop them. Forget those two. We don't even know what that would have meant in those two, a key pass breakup or two. But Ole Miss, Alabama, Miami look completely different if you portaled. So my question becomes in this day and age, when you're out shopping – how much is too much? How much do you value cornerbacks? How much do you value a guy that led the Big Ten in sacks this year, like Nick Scort and formerly Nick Carraway, Brian High? You know, what, what's the threshold versus the difference? I mean, like, how much does winning two extra games matter? And not every position is that the case, but, like, when you look back at that corner spot, if they'd have had a couple of these, you know, guys from that were in the portal this year, if there's another one or two that come up, how much difference does that make in last year's record, and how much money is that worth spending to? Well, Jimbo's still here. In if theory, that's the case. win those games. Yeah. So you also save seventy five million. So that that is the big question for any head coach, any collective, moving forward. When you try to play this GM. Money ball game, which everyone's going to have to play. How much is it worth? So, like Ollie Gordon, whatever it's going to cost Mike Gundy in Oklahoma State to keep him one more year, like, is that worth it? It might look and feel like it tonight if he runs through an AM defense that's that's just been completely picked apart going into this game. But what is it really worth? Obviously, he's worth something. But when do you hit that tipping point where you go, okay, I might not have a 1,600-yard back, but I could in this offense I could produce an 11, 1,200-yard back, and with that amount of money I could get the running back. And, you know, for example, like with Walter Nolan, A&M did everything. They, this is not – they didn't let Walt go. They wanted to keep Walt. Yeah. So make no mistake, this was not a, hey, we're just going to let him go. He's a, but if he was asking for X amount – that money, there comes a point where you go elite, but probably high maintenance interior D lineman. That could be a game changer. At worst, he's going to be pretty damn good. Versus another corner, another linebacker, and maybe maybe another D line guy. Maybe maybe. Maybe it's Scorton and and a starting a guy that ends up starting for you at linebacker that was like a second team all conference guy mm-hmm. somewhere. So that's the juggling juggling act, and that's what's pretty incredible because A and M and Mike Elko aren't the only ones that have to do it. Everyone has to do it from the number one team, from the Kirby Smarts and the Nick Sabans, all the way to you know the Group of Five level. So that's that's a fascinating aspect as we enter you know this the rest of this portal season. Short segment coming back here on Texas Radio.
It is Tex Ags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Billy Lucci is with us here for a few more minutes as we uh, get ready for the Texas Bowl tonight. Ollie Gordon, what what else about Oklahoma State should concern A and M beyond that? Uh, you're, you're, you're I'm just looking. I'm just laughing. I'm looking at people giving credit all over. So we we got sometimes I just feel like if we post it on in on the forums, it's like almost mandatory now that you have to go. To Twitter with it? Put it on Twitter or you get zero. Yeah, you get zero credit for it. Then whoever tweets it gets so. It's just such a weird time in terms of like media and reporting stuff. It's it just is. strange. I just remember people used to actually get mad if you tweeted it first and then put it on text. I was like within 60 seconds. Now I think our subscribers have at least realized that part of it, but. It's just, it's just nuts. It's just nuts. Just the, the way this thing works now. It's amazing what that one social media outlet did to sports and media and reporting. But anyway, go ahead. Oh, it's just. You just have to remember to every time I post something to go tweet, follow it up with a tweet. Uh, just beyond Ollie Gordon, what concerns you about Oklahoma State? I think their offense and their passing game. I think defensively they've got some nice players. In particular, I'm, I'm a big fan. That's you. Hold on. What are y'all talking about? The Boses? He brought up Bosa for some reason. What were y'all talking about? I don't even remember. Do you remember Nick? Why we talk, brought up Bosas? I think maybe people play. One of them opted out of a bowl game or something like yeah, that. Yeah. One of them opted out of a bowl game and just oh. opting out. And, okay. and, and Obi said that was kind of the beginning of these players heading into the NFL draft, really starting to opt mm. out. Um, I think. I think with uh, with Oklahoma State, their O line is a veteran group, and a big part of why Gordon was able to, you know, be the most productive back in the country, be the Doak, you know, win the Doak Walker. I think that running game is a big part of it. Their passing game, you got to worry about, as is the case always with Mike Gundy. I think you have to worry about you have to worry about shots down the field. You have to worry about that running game setting you up for shots down the field. And that's the other thing you have to worry about is same thing they had to worry about when they played them five years ago. Uh, short pass, short pass. You better defend that good because they can eat you up for six, seven, eight yards a clip just catching the snap and throwing that. And, and then between that and the running game, you're going to get hit over the top, especially with inexperience. At cornerback, that's going to be something that gets you. And they might. Eh, I wouldn't call Curse not inexperienced anymore, but you could be in a position where you've got, you know, between Bryce, your your deep safeties at times could be Kerr and Dalton Brooks. That's still you still pretty inexperienced back there. Um, so they could go. They're they're going to try to lull you to sleep and go over the top. They're going to try to play action you and go over the top on first down. Bowman's got a big arm. Um, I don't. I don't think he's a great quarterback by any stretch, but he's had some really nice games along the way. So if he gets hot, they can get you running and throwing, and they can score a lot of points. But they're also subject to uh, some stinker games offensively if you'll force them into it. But it's a veteran offense, and that worries me going against such an inexperienced defense. Yeah. That that's the biggest thing. Oak State's defense. They're not what they've been. The last, or I don't know if it's last couple. I think the last couple. I think they're years bad prior. stuff in the run, like 108. Yeah, yeah, like, but they're la- and I, and I actually like a couple of their linebackers, to be honest with you. But they're not what they were the last couple years defensively, where I thought they were pretty damn stout. Uh, even even when A and M played them, you know, with Malcolm Rodriguez, and they had Harville Peel here from here in at, at consolidated. Like they they had a tough defense back then. I think that's slipped a little bit. So again, I think A and M's path to winning this game is going to be they're gonna to have to win a high scoring football game. Yep. I think that that would be if A if and M wins this thing, I think you're looking at a you know, I don't know if it's a forty one thirty eight type of thing, but maybe thirty four thirty type game. Interestingly, I'm not as worried about the offenses that I've been in years past or times past, even without Anaya Smith, which is a huge loss. Like you're but I'm not as worried. I think they can. I think they'll be able to move the ball. 
it's interesting because you want to compare it to, oh, hey, they moved the ball against LSU, and they also converted a lot of fourth downs. Mm -hmm. They they had a very – it was like everything was – everything worked for them. LSU's defense was bad. And LSU – well, but I don't think Oak State's is is much better. But they had a lot working for them. Oak State has a good corner, Kobe Black's brother. He got hurt early in that Texas game, very early, and that hurt them too. But I I don't think I everything kind of went perfect for the offense in that game. And let's not forget something. That was Bobby Petrino calling the plays for Jalen Henderson and, and a young, inexperienced QB on the road, and that was Petrino calling that. It's not Petrino anymore. It'll be some form and combination of Coley and Chaney. It's different. Could that be a good thing? Could that be a bad thing? I don't know, but it's, it's different. It's, it's, they could think they're running the same exact things, and they're not. They have changed. I've, I've heard they've put a lot of different stuff in because you've had time to do it. But could be a good thing, could be a bad thing because Petrino calling plays on a Saturday, on a game day against LSU – is going to look one way. A bowl game of Coley and Cheney look different. It's going to look different. Yep. So we don't know the answer to that. And we won't know it. So I am, I am, I am still concerned about the. I'm concerned about this team and, and how they play. And look, we've seen this how many times? RC's year, they went six and six. They, or, yeah, they didn't go to a bowl. Um, Fran's year, they lost to Penn State. That was Gary Darnell coaching them. They came out. Looked good early, ended up fizzling out offensively. Um, Sumlin, you had DeRuiter coaching the, uh, the, the Texas Bowl, and that's where Tannehill won MVP, and they beat Northwestern. Uh, that was a good one. And then the Wake Forest game, they were horrific on defense and really good on offense, and it came down to a final drive where you had Starkle throw for, what, 500 yards or something crazy like that? Four, I think it was 500 and you end up losing there in the final possession. But that was at least a spirited, entertaining performance. I think that's what you'll see from this group tonight. All right, let's hit a break here. Um, that is Billy. He's done. When we come back, we'll have Ryan Broniger with us. We'll do recruiting country there. Uh, right now, they'll talk in Caldwell Country, Chevrolet. Uh, they are so good. And when you're looking for a new vehicle, when you are looking for a trade-in, when you're looking for a place that's not that far away, you need to consider Caldwell Country, Chevrolet. They have complimentary pickup. And delivery for all their service customers, a great thing to take advantage of. You know, we're all busy. We've got kids that go places. You, you got to go to work. You don't have time. They'll take care of you. Uh, they've done that for a long, long time, as, as well as uh, they're a proud supporter of Aggie Athletics. Former uh, A&M head coach, R.C. Slocum, only buys his cars there from Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Got Dante Hall, class of 2000, proud supporter of Caldwell Country Chevrolet. They're a small-town dealer making dreams come true for the Brazos Valley. When you're ready for that next vehicle, you should consider Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Remember, it's not a far drive. We're talking 15 minutes, the very edge of Brian to the beginnings of Caldwell. Uh, but it is a short conversation where you're going to love when you do business with the good people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 in Caldwell and online, CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com.
Oh, I'm on. I'm just over here looking. I didn't feel the uh, the camera change. Texas Radio presented by David Gartner's Jewelers <laughs> Rollo Insurance Studio. It is time for Recruiting Country, uh, presented by Caprock Health, a faster patient center revolution in care with two ERs in the BCS, the original 24-hour ER in South College Station on William D. Fitch and the full-service hospital uh, with ER in Bryan on Briarcrest. Online, CaprockHealthSystem.com. He is Ryan Broninger, and I'm David Nuno. Hey, You forgot one thing. It's the abbreviated Recruiting Country because, once again, Somebody gets their airtime stolen on this radio show every week. You know, it's it's not Tom Hart, not Peter Burns, not Olin, you know, not Kay. One guy gets their airtime. Kay gets screwed a lot on around uh, around Aguilan. She does. Oh. I just maybe I don't see it as often. Maybe so maybe me and Kay can start some kind of group. You know. A little therapy for each other. Perhaps. You want to go post game? We can go long. No, we, it's okay. We, we control what we do. Listen, I've been disappointed before. I know how to respond. Well, um, well, we better start flying through some topics. Well, a week after early signing day, right? And then they added a couple guys on Friday and uh, Dalen Evans, um, interest in Jernigan. A week after, how do we feel how that part shook out? Yeah, about as well as you could hope for understanding that, uh, you know, Ken, uh, Terry Bussey and Dominic McKinley were not going to sign early. And for Dominic McKinley, if he was going to sign early, it was probably not going to be with Texas A&M. Mm-hmm. So in that manner, it was about as good as you could hope for. And uh, so I was encouraged by the way that they were to they were able to rally and sign the guys that they did, 14 signees. I think when you look at it, that Florida trio, Kendall Jackson and the two kids, the two Williams kids from Tampa, mm-hmm. I mean, huge additions, especially when you look at what – next year's roster is going to look like with what we know of it right now, the construction of it right now, we're, they're going to need more line, uh, defensive linemen. They need more bodies at receiver. So, like, when you go and you make late additions to a recruiting class at those two positions of need, just from what will be able to uh, – what's going to be on the roster, I think those are massive additions. And then on top of that, but all of them being good quality players, uh, you have to be super encouraged about what they did. Well, I, I bragged about you, I think, yesterday. Like, there, People were sending some smoke signals on social media about, oh, I, I think they're going to lose out on Dalen Evans. And you maintained on the boards, if you're a premium subscriber, you would have seen it, um, like you felt really good. Your intel was pointing in the right direction. It was Jason and my intel. We were yep. both getting it uh, from different sources, but matching information, which is always encouraging. And I don't think it was a done deal until – Thursday night that Dalen was going to sign early and going to sign early with Texas A&M. You know, Dalen likes to troll. He likes to have a little bit of fun. Miles Davis even hinted at that on social media after Dalen made his announcement. But them getting him over the line and getting him to sign was your long – it was just more of a – it was another good kind of marker Mm -hmm. for – the impact that Mike Elko has had in a sh- such a short period of time. He's your longest standing commit. Texas made a late push at him without ever really getting him on campus. So that w- it would just not, wouldn't have been a good, as good of a look. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it would have hurt you from a perception standpoint more so than I think anything else. But you know, it, when Dalen is locked in and focused and if he comes to campus with a chip on his shoulder and ready to work, Dalen could be a really good football player. Like, he is as talented as any of those defensive linemen that Mike Elko signed during his first tenure here as defensive coordinator. So the upside there is insanely high. Same with Dominic McKinley. Like, if they're able to close the door on Dominic McKinley, which I think is going to be more difficult than it will be with Terry Bussey, but if they're able to get him on campus, like, it may take him a little bit to kind of rehaul his technique and – you know, transform his body, all that stuff, but the tools are there in spades. And so you are, would be really encouraged by his future if you're able to get him on campus because he's just such a phenomenal athlete as a defensive lineman. But for Mike Elko and Sean Spencer and, what, and the rest of the staff that's already here, you know, uh, Tony Gerard Eddy has played a big role in some of these, getting Dalen to sign. You know, uh, Tony was a big player in that. So these guys that maybe were – carryovers from the last staff or a guy like Tony who's an Aggie uh, had come back to College Station and and worked his way up from an analyst or GA to an analyst and now potentially even a a full-time coaching role 
like those are like notches in the belt, right? right. Those are big feathers in his hat. If if he can sign Dalen Evans, if they can find a way, he and Sean Spencer to hold on to Don McKinley, like those are pretty important pieces to his growing resume as a recruiter. Um, how about the Florida players? I mean, especially you mentioned the Williams, but just that getting that haul, especially late in the cycle, and adding them to this group here early too. Well, yeah, that's what I mentioned. It was just a, it was a huge shot in the arm. Uh, I think for perception, but also for the roster. And look, Isaiah Williams, there are people that think he comes in and plays next year immediately. Immediately. They they really love his long speed, his ability to separate at the top of routes, create, uh, uh, especially when you run him across the field, like that long speed starts mm-hmm. taking over and he runs away from defenders. I'd be really interested to see how Colin Klein uses that. From what I understand, I'm not an offensive guru by any means, but Colin Klein likes crossers and running away from defenders. It seems like that would be something that Isaiah Williams is really good at, uh, and you flipped him from Florida, so it's a, 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 divi- a SEC rival that you've started to have more and more head to heads with recently. And one, and one, uh, and you almost if you'd have given, if you'd have gone into the Derek Lagway sweepstakes at the end of the year in a better situation, in a in a better standing than they were in, I think they could have gotten it done. It was just too little, too late kind sure. of thing. And there was too much of a gap to overcome. But, yeah, there, there are certainly people that expect Isaiah Williams to come in and make an immediate impact on that receiver room. Similarly, and what we wrote in our class superlatives, I think Solomon Williams might be the best player they, that they signed. I mean, when you turn the tape on, it is hard to ignore the physicality that he plays with, the twitch and explosiveness that he plays with. It's elite-level stuff. Right. Up there with any pass rusher – that I scouted and that I looked at or that I watched over this recruiting cycle. It is an advanced arsenal of pass rush skills for an 18-year-old kid, and he plays with such good raw power right now. Like, I've got no idea what the weight room numbers say, but I can watch that his play strength is through the roof just by the way that defenders react to him and the way ball carriers react to him whenever he gets to them. So I I really – those are two enormous additions – out of that Carroll Wood Day School in, in Tampa, which is a school that Florida, from what I understand, Florida has had problems recruiting. I don't know if, if there's some kind of thing there. You know, A&M fans like to think that there's a thing at North Shore. Maybe they just need to get one guy to get them over the hump. But Florida's had trouble recruiting Carroll Wood Day School and talking to some few few guys on the Gators beat. But uh, those three, that trio, when you put Kendall Jackson in there, when again, when you turn on Kendall Jackson's tape and you look at his height and weight – you're going, how does this kid – like, he's an SEC defender. He yep. looks like all of them. He plays like all of them. And I've heard he's an outstanding character culture guy for the locker room. Uh, so, you got to be super excited about what they're able to do and, and go get that in the final, you know, 24, 48 hours of that early signing period. All right, let's hit a break. I want to ask you about Nick Scorton when we come back and some other thoughts here. It's Tex Ags Radio. We're doing uh, Recruiting Country, brought to you by Caprock Health.
Texags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. We've got uh, Bronny here for Recruiting Country. Bronny, Nick Scorton, a name that folks around here uh, recognize. Grew up in Bryan. Yeah, well, I actually grew up in Bryan and in College Station. Formerly Nick Carraway. Changed his name to Nick Scorton. Uh, I believe that's his blood father. I think that's right. But changed yeah. his name from Carraway to Scorton um, while he was at Purdue. But grew up here. Uh, I actually um, – had him in class when I was a PE coach for a year at Oakwood Intermediate right down the road. So at least part of his time spent growing up was right across the street from Kyle Field here in College Station. But went to high school in Bryan, had a great career for the Vikings, played for Ross Rogers over there, uh, and was kind of a man. You know, He played half of his high school career at defensive end, half of it at stand-up linebacker, and was just kind of an in-between guy. But right. I knew – I knew then, and I, I can absolutely say with certainty now, that it was a player that Mike Elko and, at the time, Tyler Santucci took a real interest in, but didn't know how he would grow, didn't know what he would turn into. And so uh, I think that was the, that same 2022 recruiting cycle, and it's so funny to listen to – not even listen, but to read people on the message board that are saying, I can't believe we let this kid get out uh, in 2022. He's a local kid, and look what he's turned into. And I'm like, could you imagine – and I love Nick, and he was a fantastic player, and there was a ton of upside coming out of Brian High. But could you imagine that if a would have taken him, what the response would have been? If a had taken him over a Harold Perkins in that class right, or right, Marshall right. Harris, those guys that they were recruiting, they, everybody would be like, why are we going after these local kids and not the five stars? Like, you can't have it both ways. But hindsight's always really easy to go back and critique and say what should have done, right? Whatever. It's a local kid who has turned into a six foot four, 280 pound Beast. monster. Yep that led the Big Ten in sacks this past season. And, uh, you know, it was one of those names that was being floated to us that potentially could go into the portal that we were, like, we kept saying. Like, there are names out there that we're hearing could go in that I think would have legit a and interest, a and interest. They just haven't gone in yet. It was him, and there are a couple of others that I'm waiting to see what happens within the next week. Um, just familiar names to people on that follow A&M recruiting uh, that chose to go elsewhere. But Nick – He's not officially in yet. You know, that tweet that went out, if you read it, it says he has intentions of going in. And I do believe that the ball is rolling on him to go in. But there's like a 48-hour window that once you file the paperwork, you can still back out. And so he, he would officially go in, I believe, tomorrow. And that's when schools can technically start contacting him. That being said, some of the early schools that I've heard that are sticking out for him on his side – um, or Texas A&M. I feel very good about the Aggies, you know, should all this keep going in the direction that it is. feel very good about the Aggies getting him on campus for a visit. Um, I also think Miami might be involved. I also think maybe Louisville might be involved. Okay. Uh, but feel pretty good about A&M and Miami, I feel like are two of the real contenders. Uh, I don't know about the third. I think it's Louisville, but I have, I'm not a thousand percent sure on that. That was – Yesterday, right as the news was coming out, some people from Brian, that's what they were telling me. Okay. Now, that's been 24 hours, and he's one of the more of the high, uh, highly contested names and highly sought-after names in the transfer portal. So I'm sure he's getting phone calls from everybody across the country trying to get him in on visits. I do believe that Texas A&M is going to get an official visit either that first weekend or that second weekend in January – Whenever they're trying to, I know that that's like going to be a huge portal weekend for A&M and everybody else across the country to get in portal visitors. So I feel good about where things stand right now about him coming to College Station. Well, I say coming to College Station. He's been in College Station or in Bryan for but, Christmas but break. But on campus. But on campus for an official visit. Thank you, Bronny. Appreciate thank, you, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, tomorrow on Texas Ags Radio, we will have a recap of the Texas Bowl. Billy will be with us. We'll have some other guests as well. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Appreciate you all. We will see you mañana.